12, 2023, um, Santa Rosa City Schools uh, board meeting. Are there any comments on closed session items? Looks like we have one. I let's do which item are you speaking on? Which one of the three? Okay, so then I'll give you three for each. Three minutes for each. All right, go ahead. And is there a timer up there somewhere? Okay, good. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Alexander Chernoff, and I wish to address uh, the issue of student expulsions and performance of the superintendent and or teachers. I find that perhaps it's time for all teachers and people in this realm to take a deeper look at what's been happening. When the teachers themselves are not exactly abiding by the things that they teach. For example, there's gonna be a teacher strike coming up, I hear. They're striking for more money. They want a living wage. But at the same time, we're in a system that has been bespoke by people from Yeshua, the one we call Jesus, my father, to any number of people through time that the usurist system causes nothing but war and problems. So to, to strike for a living wage under the usurist system causes me to think of the word foolishness because I believe that perhaps the teachers need to look different and more deeper. I, I heard the word looking at their core issues several times uh, locally in papers and nationwide. What's the core issue of all this? And so we don't teach the U.S. Constitution. And I have heard people say this and that and the other, but it actually came from the Iroquois. And so we have teachers that are going to expel students for certain things. But in the meantime, the teachers and the community at large ignores the Constitution, specifically the 13th Amendment which says no one with a title of nobility may hold public office in America. Esquires is a nobility title. They don't belong in the White House as a senator, as a congressperson, as a sitting judge, or even on city council. It is contrary because people seem to not understand what this all means. The Bar Association, first and foremost, serves by law, papal law, not the people, not the general public, but papal law. And so we have on the other side of town tonight, a meeting with two politicians. And one of them is uh, Mike Thompson, the Congressman. And all this ties into the very topics that we're discussing. And he's a Vietnam veteran. He is one of those who has echoed the sentiment leaving no soldier behind. Mr. Alexander, that was three minutes. So you have three more. Oh, okay, yep. so I got another three, right? Correct. So I'm just gonna let it all flow together. So Senator Mike Thompson is one of those who, I mean, Congressman says that leave no soldier behind. Well, most all veterans and plenty of detectives and investigators know full well that, um, Where was I? They know full well that Green Beret surgeon, Dr. Jeffrey McDonald, in charge of Fort Bragg military base, blew the whistle on George Herbert Walker Bush's heroin operations. And for that, he was rewarded with the termination of his pregnant wife, two daughters, and placed into prison under false circumstances and has been now there for 51 years. So Congressman Thompson, and you teachers 
how is it that we ignore this? What is the purpose that we ignore this? I would love for you to answer that, at least to yourselves. And there's an old Motown song that says, teachers, teachers, time to teach a new way. So now we also have a man named Robert Kennedy Jr. running for president. And the, the Kennedys, we all used to look up to them. And they were terminated one by one by one, just like Martin Luther King, Malcolm, Malcolm X, pretty much by the same people, by the same direction, which was Herbert Walker Bush. So now we remember that there was a, a nice lady from Oakland. What was her name? The one that voted no on the war, Barbara Lee. She voted no, and she was given ovations and she was given awards. Whereas Robert Kennedy, a river keeper, and with the Children's Defense Fund, stands up and tells people clearly through scientific facts in detail with thousands of doctors backing him up that vaccines are not a good thing. And at the bottom line core, no matter how many times we've been lied to about stuff, our common sense also indicates it is not a good thing. And so we need more heroes. We need more freedom and liberty influencers. And the latest one that showed up was surprisingly Eddie Alvarez. In the paper, it said he owes $400,000 in taxes. Well, I think maybe Eddie would suggest to the public to look up Aaron Russo's $50,000 IRS offer, whereas seven IRS agents quit because they could not find any law that says we owe them taxes whatsoever. So I would like to offer Eddie 400,000 of Americans to stand up together and shut down this system and place it into submission and explain to them that we are the most powerful people in the most powerful state in the world. I am Peter, I, hear, I say it, you hear it, let it be so. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will go to Online, see if there's anybody online that would like to uh, speak on public on the closed session items. I mean, there are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to make a comment on our closed session agenda. Please raise your hand. Looks like there's no attendees. So, Vice President Medina, there are no hands raised. We will now close to, well, recess to closed session. Thank you. Sorry, for some reason, the audio is not working. Can you guys hear me? Thank you. Good, well, good evening, Superintendent. Good evening, President and Board Members and Santa Rosa City Communities. I will now proceed to read the land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that Santa Rosa City Schools is on the traditional territory and homeland of the Pomo people, traditional territory and homeland of the coastal Miwok people, and honor with gratitude the land itself and people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This land acknowledgement calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Santa Rosa City Schools more accountable to the needs of American Indians and indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. As I'm sure everybody's able to tell, I'm not President Manieri. Um, she's unable to be here today due to an illness, but I will be presiding over the meeting. Um, if anybody uh, is going to need to make any uh, public comments, make sure you grab one of the blue cards up there and turn them in over there.
Now we have no items to report, no actions taken in closed session. We'll move on to C4. Items uh, considered in closed session for action and open session. First, we have uh, item 2223-24. Um, is there, an, would like to entertain a motion? Is there anybody like to move it? I move to approve item 22-23-24. I will second. Moved by Director Flores, seconded by uh, Director Sheffield. Roll call vote. Director Flores. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Vice President Medina. Aye. Moving on to item 22-23-25, do I hear a motion? I move to approve item 22-23-25. There a second? I second the motion. Moved by Clerk Flores, seconded by D Trustee McNally. Roll call vote, please. Director Flores. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Vice President Medina. Aye. Now for item 22-23-27, is there a motion? I move to approve item 22-23-27. I second the motion. Moved by Clerk Flores, seconded by Trustee McNally. Uh, roll call vote, please. Director Flores. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Vice President Medina. Aye. All right, moving on down the agenda. Are there any statements of abstention? Any adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none, let's move on to our special presentations. Uh, Superintendent Trinnell, you want to take lead? Vice President Medina, tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from two of our schools. We'll be starting with Santa Rosa Charter School for the Arts, followed by Santa Rosa Middle School. And um, I welcome our principal forward to give an introduction um, for Santa Rosa Charter School for the Arts. Good evening, Vice President Medina, esteemed members of the board and Superintendent Trinnell. I'm Sarah Crank, principal of the Santa Rosa Charter School for the Arts. And tonight, it gives me great pleasure to present this award to Alice Stumba, a student who has truly made a positive impact on her peers and teacher. Our instructional team at the Arts Charter has had the pleasure of witnessing Alice's passion for the arts, her exceptional work ethic, and her unwavering commitment to excellence. She brings a level of enthusiasm to class that is infectious, and she has consistently demonstrated a positive attitude and a purposeful desire to contribute to every product that she is involved in. Alice's energy and momentum have been instrumental in driving her peers to work harder and achieve their goals. Alice is not only an outstanding theater student, but also a dedicated and academically strong individual who supports others as a result. She possesses a great sense of humor, shows integrity in everything she does, and is a joy to have in the classroom. Her middle school science teacher has had Alice as a student for three years and has noted that she is a quiet lead by example classroom leader. Although modest in nature, Alice has a lot to be proud of. She has been active in our school's garden club, thrived in class debates, served as a safe school ambassador, and is always willing to try new things. She has a lot of heart and is a solid human being who is never too busy to lend a helping hand. Ella Stumba is a student who has made a significant impact in the classroom and beyond. Congratulations, Alice, and keep up the excellent work.
It is my pleasure to recognize and honor one of our exceptional teachers, Michelle Homestead, who has made a significant impact on our middle school students. Michelle Homestead is our science teacher, and she has been working tirelessly with our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders as they grapple with everything from debates on GMO food products to collecting garbage around campus to support waste awareness with a school-wide trash and show. <laughs> In addition to her excellent teaching skills, Michelle Homestead has gone above and beyond to create a dynamic learning environment for our students. She has revived the School Garden Club, which provides a hands-on learning experience for our TK through eighth grade students to explore the natural world. She has also organized and fundraised for our amazing field trips out to the Pinnacle Gulch in Bodega Bay, where our students have been able to see and learn about marine life up close. Michelle Homestead served as our lead teacher for the Arts Charter Middle School this year, where she has been a strong and supportive leader. Her passion for teaching and helping students extends throughout our school as she recently ran the Odyssey of the Mind after school enrichment group for younger elementary grades, which has provided our students with opportunities to create and develop their critical thinking and problem solving skills. We are truly grateful for all that Michelle Homestead has done for our students and our school community. Her dedication and passion for teaching have inspired our students to pursue their interests in science and technology. We feel fortunate to have her as part of our team, and we are confident that her impact will continue to be felt by our students for years to come. At our TK through eighth grade school, we are fortunate to have Sana Samia, a dedicated restorative specialist who helps our students resolve conflicts in a constructive and positive way. Sana has had a profound impact on our school community. He has helped to create a more inclusive and supportive learning environment where students feel valued and supported. Our students have developed stronger relationships with their peers and teachers as a result of addressing social emotional stress factors with Sana. In addition, students who have received one-on-one -on -one support from him feel more confident and better equipped to deal with the challenges of school and life. One of the most impressive aspects of his work is Sana's ability to connect with students. He is patient, kind, and empathetic, and he creates a safe space where students feel comfortable sharing their thoughts and feelings. By encouraging students to listen to one another and express their feelings, he helps them to develop empathy and understanding. Sana has created a range of activities that encourage students to collaborate, communicate, and work together to solve problems. For example, he has organized team building activities, group discussions, and peer-to-peer -peer mentoring to support our students school-wide. These initiatives have been as successful in fostering a sense of community and connectedness among students and have helped to build positive relationships between students and staff. We are incredibly grateful for the work that Sana does. He plays a critical role in promoting a safe, supportive and inclusive school community. Sana is helping our students develop the skills they need to become responsible and compassionate members of society. We are proud to have him on our team at the Arts Charter. Next, we will have um, Santa Rosa Middle School, 
and um, our assistant principal will be presenting information tonight. Thank you for letting us come up and present all of our wonderful people that are working with our schools. Um, thank you, Anna Trinnell, for being here, Superintendent, Mr. Omar Medina, and the directors and student board member. Um, I am here to present Anna Alexa Torres. She is our student of the month at Santa Rosa Middle School. It gives me great pleasure to present this award to Alexa, a student who has truly made a positive impact on her peers, teachers, and staff. Alexa is an exceptional student, not only academically, but socially with her peers as well. She is bright, kind-hearted, generous, and compassionate. You can find her always helping others and serving our school community. Alexa is a very hardworking, diligent student. She is not afraid to take on tasks for others and her school. Alexa goes above and beyond. She is the first one to ask for help or clarifying questions. And she is always willing to go the extra mile simply by asking if there is more that she could do. She is a wonderful team player. She is our ASB president this year and dedicated to making sure students have a wonderful experience at Santa Rosa Middle. She spent every single passing period during the first semester coming to the office to play the tardy reminder music just before the tardy bell rings. This set the tone for our school-wide focus, helping each other to be on time. Alexa's sacrifice is to be a part of that work was lost on no one. She also participates in the morning announcements with her leadership class and will take on any extra things that need to get done. If, it, if that isn't enough, she is also an athlete. She is such a joy to be around and very well-rounded. Finally, Alexa is one of the bravest students that I have ever known. She spoke in front of more than 800 people from the heart at the listening circle that was held by the district. She is such an inspiration to all students and adults. Alexa has dedicated so much of her time and energy to making Santa Rosa Middle a great place to be. She has been such a positive impact on all of us with an outstanding personality. Watch out folks, this girl will probably be president someday. Certainly whatever she chooses to do, is within her reach. Thank you. This is all for you. The next one is for Brooke Wilcox. She is our Santa Rosa Middle School Classified Employee of the Month. She is currently at school, 
with the sixth grade parent meetings. This is with great pride that Santa Rosa Middle School honors Brooke Wilcox as our classified employee of the year. Brooke is the master of controlling disaster. She is always multitasking, even when she is having a conversation with you. We are in awe of the tasks that she takes on and makes it look like a breeze. Brooke has become quite a detective when it comes to our cameras and letting us know where we may need to be to check on students and behavior during break and lunch. She is very adept at, at it and she enjoys it when she is not busy with all the other tasks that she is fulfilling. Other times she will take the time to mingle with students and staff during break and lunch. Brooke has a wonderful personality and teachers enjoy spending time with her, checking in and sharing conversations. She is able to help fix instructional needs when teachers ask and is very adept at juggling all her tasks. She assists with student behavior, event planning and functions. School is her domain and she knows how to run it smoothly. She is admired for her ability to remain professional and fun in the face of adversity. Brooke is a master at her role. Brooke helps, as helps us as administrators to keep us on track and organized. She is the manager of all things behind the scenes. And today we get to show her how much she is truly appreciated. None, no one would be as good as they are if it weren't for Brooke. For this reason, I and others celebrate her today and every day. Our Certificated Employee of the Month, it is great, it is with great honor and pleasure to recognize an exceptional teacher, Casey May Terena, who has made an incredible impact with our middle school students. Casey May Terena is one of our physical education teachers who has dedicated her time in the very wee hours in the morning to teach our highly driven zero period PE class. Casey May Terena goes above and beyond her responsibilities as a PE teacher. She enjoys co coaching multiple sports and has taken on leadership role as our department chairperson for PE. She stepped in when we were in need of an eighth grade advisor, when no one else felt that they could take on that large task and planning that it requires to have a successful end of the year celebration for our eighth graders. Casey is highly de dedicated to our school, not just in the classroom, well, for her, the gym, but, in tr but she truly cares about our students, teachers, and staff. She maintains her role as union representative for our teachers and is always willing to find solutions for situations that, are, that arise. She has always been willing to step in when we are short staffed and sub for colleagues. You will also find Casey out on the blacktop visiting with kids during break and lunch and just being another pair of eyes for supervision, even though she isn't required to. We are truly grateful for all that Casey has done for our students, staff and colleagues and community over the years. She is dedicated to making our school the best place it can be. Students are inspired by her drive and believe that they too can achieve great things with a bit of determination and self-discipline. We feel fortunate to have her as part of our team and we are confident that her impact will continue to be felt by our students and staff for years to come. Thank you. Thank you for those presentations. Always my favorite part of the meeting. Yeah. Just wanna thank Ms. Bushman for being here today as Ms. O'Connor is at the school for their seventh grade um, meetings this evening. Thank you for being here. Now we're gonna move on to item CA, which is school site uh, parent organization updates. Uh, we'll start with Santa Rosa Charter School for the Arts.
Good evening, Superintendent Trinnell and members of the board. My name is Gina Javier. I am a parent volunteer treasurer at the SACO, which stands for School for the Arts Community Organization. Um, we're the PTO at the San Rosa Charter for the Arts. And I wanted to introduce to you another fellow board member here, Abby Mooney. She's our secretary. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, I'm Abby Mooney, and I am the secretary of SACO, our PTO. Um, I have some good news for you about the year that we just had. Um, our 22-23 school year has been a year of renewed vigor for the board. Um, we have new and seasoned PTO members uh, this year. We began with our annual SEED fundraiser, which is a student, which stands for Student Education Enhancement Drive. Um, our community raised $15,230 for our teachers to purchase supplies to enhance the arts integrated education of our students. Um, our annual budget was passed in October 2022, which a lot of allocated funds to various items, including new PE equipment, artist residencies, bicycle racks, chairs for our eighth grade chair project, graduation project, um, library improvements, instrument maintenance, storage, leadership supplies, and many more things. Um, we organized several successful events this year so far, including our Halloween Carnival, which is a community event that we have um, annually, our family dance, which is a fundraiser and a community event. It was in February and we raised approximately $2,700. Um, we had the book fair last month in March and raised $10,000 in sales. The school gets to keep approximately $5,000 um, to use for new books for our libraries and to go back into our classrooms. The students had so much fun. It was a great time. Um, in May, we will be honoring our teachers during Teacher Appreciation Week. We plan to host donuts and coffee as, as well as a lunch for the faculty and staff. Um, on April 28th, we will host our biggest annual event, the Art Walk, which is our school's walkathon. Um, last year, it raised $24,639. Um, it's a fun day of music, walking, prizes, raffle baskets, and time spent with each other. We began sol soliciting funds at the end of March, and we will continue to collect funds. I'm actually the chair of that event, and I can tell you that we've raised $5,000 so far, and our goal is $20,000 this year. Um, and everyone's really looking forward to it. Uh, looking forward to 23 and 24 school year, we hope to participate in the city's annual Rose Parade and to grow our board to its 10 parent volunteer capacity. We're also looking forward to planning the Welcome Back Ice Cream Social to kick off the school year. We know that 2023 and 24 is going to be a great year. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. If we can uh, now move on to Santa Rosa Middle School. If Maria Martinez is on joining us on Zoom, could you please raise your hand at this time? I don't see Maria just yet, so maybe we can start with Mr. Lyon and then come back to her. All right. All right. Is your mic on? Uh oh, I'm starting over. I reclaim my time. Good evening, uh, President Manieri, Vice President Medina, Superintendent Trunell, and members of the board and our community. I am Will Lyon, president of Santa Rosa Middle School's parent, faculty, student organization. And I'm here to report that Santa Rosa Middle School is an excellent place to be 12 or 13 years old. It is happy, it is healthy, and it is a safe middle school. And I'm grateful that my child and the other 450 students are Cougars. This year has been a rebuilding year for the PFSO. With the strong leadership of our treasurer, Stacy Keegan, we were able to reestablish our nonprofit status, hold three dine and donate fundraisers so far, and sponsor one staff appreciation lunch to celebrate the outstanding Cougar staff. The rest of our work has been to support the existing programs and events. Our venerable leadership teacher, Deborah Laprath, 
who could give a master class in how to do that role. And her students are always a highlight of our PFSO meetings. Principal O'Connor is having an excellent first year supported by Vice Principal Bushman and the PFSO has spent most of our energy supporting them and the rest of the staff in making Santa Rosa Middle School special. An abbreviated list includes a turkey trot. That's a mile run for Thanksgiving with amazing prizes, including actual turkeys. There's safe routes to school, lunchtime activities, dances, rallies, spirit week, spirit month, leadership fundraisers, and a human day with a diverse group of guest speakers from the community. Santa Rosa Middle School also has a strong staff that goes above and beyond for the students, including stepping up to sub on their preps so admin can do administrative work and leading these super fun clubs, garden, karaoke, video game, yoga, mini wargaming, pride, bike, chess, Rubik's, games, freestyle crew, anime, reading, book, entomology, crochet, and a yearbook club which makes their actual yearbook. Don't you want to be in a few of those clubs? Santa Rosa Middle School isn't perfect, but the problems we're having are the same problems we are having all over. We need more adult supervision and timely consequences for unsafe and disrespectful behaviors. Our struggling students need more support to prepare them for high school, where the stakes and graduation requirements are much higher. It was hard to be a seventh or eighth grader before the fires, before A through G all the way, before COVID. Nobody, when they play the what age would you like to go back to game, says they want to go back to 12 or 13 years old. But if that did happen to you, God bless your heart, you would be lucky to be 12 or 13 again at Santa Rosa Middle School. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Ahora tenemos la señora María Martínez presente. Ms. María Martínez present or online o está en línea. Si está en línea, por favor, levante su mano. All right, let's just wait about 30 seconds. Let's take a quick 30 second recess. Hope we uh, get back from her. I just texted, so I'm hoping she'll be on shortly. Do you copy? She is. Sorry. Yeah, what's up? Okay, we're about to start back up. Hello. Um, hi. Hello. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me here today. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to your presentation. You can go ahead and start at any moment. Okay. Um, so yeah, my um, my name is Maria Martinez, and I'm uh, the family um, engagement facilitator here at Santa Rosa Middle School. I started back in November, and um, it's been a pleasure working with kids and families um, because I talk to them all the all the time on a daily basis. I talk to them over the phone and they ask me questions like how their kids are doing and we look at their progress. We also kind of see like how we can improve, how I can help them. And I also have the opportunity uh, to listen to the parents' concerns in the ELAC meetings that take place uh, every month. And we have had a great success in those meetings because um, a lot of parents are showing up because they do care about their students and and they ask a lot of questions. And two months ago, we had a guest speaker, Rafael Vasquez, 
He's a um, professor and counselor at Santa Rosa Junior College. Oh, sorry. And, and he, um, he came and he gave a presentation about um, what students can do uh, to avoid um, like um, bullying and stuff and what parents can do about it. And parents were so happy to have him. And because they were so happy and they asked him a lot of questions and they participated, they want him back. So we gotta have Rafael Vasquez again for the 26th. And we're hoping to get a lot of parents. And the, um, this time the presentation is gonna be about uh, baby and um, drugs and smoking because we have had some issues with that. And parents are just gonna, I'm pretty sure they, they're gonna love that topic and I'm pretty sure they're gonna ask questions and they're gonna put their concerns. So, and yeah, I look forward to next year. So to have more parents come to those meetings and to connect with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll now be moving on to uh, public comments on non-agenda items. Ahora vamos a hacer comentarios on cosas que no están en la agenda. So uh, raise your hand online or turn in a blue card if you haven't already. Uh, pueden levantar la mano en línea o si están presentes pueden entregar una tarjeta azul para hacer comentarios en cosas que no están en la agenda. And we'll start in person. Um, the first person will be Peter Chernoff. After that, we'll go to a person online. And then after Peter, we have Eric Weiss. Uh, Peter, we'll, we'll have three minutes uh, per speaker. Thank you. Are we on? Thank you very much. Territorial acknowledgement of this land to the promise of America into the gardens of Genesis, just as planned. Please watch, fear no fruit. So be clear to understand that with greenhouses, we may grow the world's every fresh veggie and fruit never can. With respect and thanks to Luther Burbank and Veterans Victory Gardens, to truly live, let us forgive, having been born into a world of lies and alibis. For when my father Yeshua stated, as you do unto the least of me, you do unto me and therefore yourselves. He was truly speaking about all life-loving animals. And in the eyes of Almighty, abusing and slaughterhouse murdering these innocent beings is not only worse than sexual abuse, but even more so, in fact, provides abusers spiritual permission to harm innocent children. World-famous Native American artist Leonard Peltier featured in Robert Redford's incident at Oglala, spiritually being the first man scheduled to step into the promised land. Has been waiting for 48 years, and now the whole world walks a true trial of tears. For freedom and liberty, we thirst. Free the animals, the innocent animals, first. Two topics in the news with schools, guns. Guns versus cancers delivered from the animal slaughterhouse industry. An average of 137 children die every day in America from such cancers created by Fort Detrick, APGMD, whereas 241 diseases, cancers, and conditions and plagues delivered since 1951 inoculated into all slaughterhouse bound animals was designed to eliminate populations and curb them. The topic of abortion. I humbly suggest you contact your Native American shaman and medicine women, as they have always had knowledge of herbs and roots to verifiably avoid pregnancy till otherwise decided. 
for it is only the system of corruption that wants people divided on this issue. And this is a perfect time for us to bring this all together with common sense and knowledge most beautiful and spiritually beautiful by a lot of these Native American uh, medicine women and shamans. I am Peter. I'm here speaking truth to power. Rosebud, rosebud, coming out of flower. I say it, you hear it, so be it. It is so, it is done. Amen, amen, Thank aho. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now move on to our first online speaker. Our first online speaker is Meryl Bloomseth. Hi, hello, members of the board, Superintendent Trinnell and community. My name is Meryl Blomseth. I have been working for the district for more than 11 years. I have the privilege of serving the Griffins, the students, and families at Monroe Elementary School as the EL TOSA. It is critical that we spend our money to support classrooms. We need more hands on deck in schools like Monroe. Research show that there is a bi-directional relation, relationship with poverty and mood and anxiety disorders. In elementary classrooms, this looks like inattentiveness, hyperactivity, throwing chairs, screaming, physical aggression, selective mutism, disengaged behaviors, and more. Our SPED team and full-time counselor are regularly pulled into crisis work, which means their students are impacted. At Monroe, we have one full-time counselor and one site-based therapist who comes every Friday. We share her with Burbank, Lincoln, and Steel Lane. We need a full-time site-based therapist. According to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the causal relationship between poverty and mental health is even more pertinent given the ongoing pandemic, which has disproportionately affected the poor and may have lasting effects on their economic and mental well-being. The CDC notes that much of this building, a foundation for children's learning, health, and overall life success, is grounded in the first eight years of life, with special attention in years two to seven. This evidence is this evidence. This is evidence that elementary students need more adults in classrooms. I ask you to reduce class sizes to 24 for all elementary age classrooms or pay a livable competitive wage to instructional aides in each elementary classroom. Teachers are inundated with helping young children regulate their emotions, persevere through challenging tasks, and facil facilitate working through peer interactions. It is exhausting to lovingly hold boundaries for four to 12 year olds and, and on, and also to ensure that we teach all the standards expected. Teachers wear many hats, teacher, counselor, mother. It is not sustainable to do that for 30 plus children. The NEA National Education Association recommends that there be 20 students in a regular elementary and secondary class. We need more adults in the classroom to support the wellness of our students. Please allocate one site-based therapist per school. Spending our money to support students at this critical age will pay off tenfold in the future. I urge you to consider this long-term investment. Doing this will help retain qualified teachers and meet student needs and support our community's future. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll go to Eric Fife here in person. Hello. Jaden Pienta, say his name. He's dead. Yet the interview with uh, Anna Trinnell that I read in the Press Democrat described it as a March 1st stabbing. Okay. More accurately, it was a murder. And then more precisely, it was a preventable murder. We all know that we have an urgent crisis of violence in our schools that needs to be addressed immediately. We're six weeks out from that March 1st preventable murder. And what did we get? We got a cell phone app. We got a cell phone app for the students to report anything that they see. So we send a message to our students that they're on their own. They have to be the watch keepers and worry about security. The board should be addressing security and now. Allow the students to worry about learning. Also in the interview, Ms. Trinnell is quoted as reporting that only 8% of the students felt uncomfortable around police officers at the school. So the board votes unanimously to suspend the SRO program based on 8%. What about the other 92%? 
What about the overwhelming majority of parents, teachers, students, administrators, and law enforcement who were singing the praises of the relationship over the past 25 years? So we send a message to our students that we don't believe in representative democracy. A small number of individuals on the school board who don't attend the schools, don't have kids in the schools, decide for all of us what our security needs are. I feel for that 8%, I really do. Are we using our mental health resources to help them overcome this irrational fear of police? We're supposed to prepare our children to be ready for the real world and what they will encounter. We teach them how to drive safely. We teach them how to use condoms, but we don't teach them how to interact with police. We remove the cops from our campus and try to shield our kids from them. So the message we send to our children is, run from your fears, ignore them. Don't educate yourself. Are we preparing our kids to go to the JC, to the Cal State, to the UC? Not only do they have cops on their campuses, they have their own dedicated police departments. All right, we're told that we can't physically secure our campuses because we don't want our campuses to look like prisons. <laughs> okay. So we all have fences around our homes. We all have metal security doors, ring doorbell cameras, home security alarms that automatically call the police. Does your home feel like a prison? I walked through a metal detector to go to the Giants game. I went through a metal detector to see Chappelle at the LBC. So what's the message? Thank we, you. We value security there. Thank you. Thank you for our kids. Next, we'll move on to the next speaker online, uh, Ms. Adina Flores. Good evening, board and superintendent. The district is now aware that uh, the recommendation for termination paperwork you guys sent me was based on completely blatant lies. <laughs> so you received an email from uh, President Kristen Lange of the NAACP Santa Rosa Sonoma County chapter. Ms. Lange didn't realize I could request public records about myself. And she did send an email in late June 2022. She stated that I caused a scene at the 2022 Juneteenth event. And I was uh, asked to leave and essentially escorted out. And the MC announced this over the mic. Um, I sent Ms. Lange and the district videos and text messages to show live videos um, that I was at Blunts and Moore Oakland's at the dispensary. And I was also in Vallejo with my fiance and his daughter, which is actually confirmed in the court paperwork with his daughter's mom. Um, and the district actually knows I go and do this every Saturday. And Ms. Lange, as she dug herself into this further hole, stated in a reply that uh, she uh saw me at the beginning of the event so unless I have a doppelganger I wasn't there and I have about five witnesses who've also confirmed that I was not there uh so being that you failed to investigate any statements I brought forth because again the NAACP is involved in major money laundering which I tried to express to the district and as Miss Lange stated in her email she's your equity partner so I don't find stealing uh, from Black people as a Black person to be equitable. Maybe you guys do. I That's frowned upon in my book. So um, I am now writing for the California Globe, as I stated. I did reference Mr. Darnell Bowen in my last uh, article. He is one of the executive team members to the NAACP, and he's also the controller to Hello Alice, uh, Elizabeth Gore's company, Supervisor Gore's wife. And uh, I have a lovely article coming out this week, which is all about Santa Rosa City Schools. And it actually includes your guys' text messages um, explaining why I was pushed out of the district because, again, there's a lot of money laundering going on. And these aren't basement accusations, as everyone likes to say. It's just funny, after almost two years, I can't get a single uh, rebuttal. And uh, now I'm actually being paid as a consultant $150 an hour to help uh, people who are not getting any support from their attorneys because I'm so far more competent than I was as an EA. <laughs> so um, I'm not incompetent. I actually uh, will be continuing this fight as long as I need to until you guys want to own up and say the truth. And until then, I'll write articles about every single incident that transpired at San Rosa City Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flores. Our next speaker is 
online. Uh, Jonathan Mucha, I believe it is. Hello, Santa Rosa City School Board of Directors, Superintendent Trunell, and all that might be in attendance in person and online. My name is Jonathan Moko, and I'm a teacher at Santa Rosa High School. It has been a few years since I have publicly spoken to the board. The disinterested and dismissive actions of the previous board members inspired my hiatus. This board and Superintendent Trunell have committed to active listening to the community, teachers, and students. I hope this is an honest and dedicated goal, not simply an attempt to placate the community. Santa Rosa City Schools is in a crisis of our own making. While not all of this crisis can be blamed on newer board members or superintendent with a short tenure in the district, you are the elected and paid officials that have assumed the power structure. It is time for leadership to take action, demonstrating your commitment to improvements within our schools. During my nine years as a teacher in this district, district, I have seen nothing but the dismantling of programs without any evidence of a clear and concise direction toward building anything in its place. The district removed all small necessary schools with no plan of replacement. The district removed all classes that were not college preparatory with no plan of replacement. The district removed sheltered classes with no plan of replacement. The district removed or limited CTE pathways with no plan of replacement. The district removed school resource officers with no plan or replacement. Their district removed most student consequences with no plan or replacement. I ask an honest question. What of value has the district added during this time? Here are a few things that have, that have been added to our district intentionally or unintentionally. More students are failing than ever. More violence than ever. More mental health issues than ever. More disengaged and demoralized students than ever. More IEPs and 504s to cover academic deficiencies than ever. More suggestions that teacher work harder to build relationships than ever. My next honest question, what is the plan? The status quo is failing and actively harming our students, staff, and community. My colleague, Andy Brennan, wrote an amazing close to home analyzing the state of our district. He addressed complex topics and rational dialogue, expressing suggestions for improvement. Andy made a proactive attempt to find solutions to some of our problems. Reactively, Superintendent Trunell awaited an interview in many more words, she communicated significantly less. More importantly, she failed to provide evidence of a plan or insight of potential solutions. It is time for action. Our one-size-fits-all approach of pushing all students to college is not working. We know what policies can be effective because we have had them before. We need to bring back alternatives for students. We need options to meet students at their current level of need. We need to pay competitive wages to fill vacancies, resulting in more qualified adults on campuses interacting with students. I admit there were flaws in, flaws in previous programs, but let's ask the hard questions and give honest answers to revive the strengths of these programs. Let us actively rebuild what has been demolished and left in disrepair. Let us give students the choice that they need. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Shelby Pryor. Good evening, board. <clears throat> It's very interesting to me that I've heard a couple of parents still stay active on the fact that you had a murder take place in your school. It's very interesting to me that the moment I raised my voice, you received police officers at your aid because you were afraid of me. These children are afraid of the things that they have to deal with every single day. And they don't have two or three officers at their beck and call. They don't have a one. The cowardice that you guys express amongst your colleagues when you talk about us in your private lives is very funny and excessive. I'm glad I ran some space in your little tiny fragile heads. There's something that I also would like to discuss. I would like to discuss the fact that the kids' voices were not heard. You haven't you just heard the man prior to this, and he also talked about the fact that you had no plan to replace a single thing that you removed. And the effects of the things that you removed shows a great effect on the children who they used to be able to participate in those things and have those securities and safeties. So we can see that the things that you've chosen do not work. And we can see the lack of ability to be a solution finder to do this work is something you're incapable of doing. So how can we continue to put our faith and trust in you 
as the people who are supposed to be leading from the front when it seems like you're not hearing some of the basic ideas of how to deal with the situations in schools. The police are the people you call once the shooting starts. You have no one mitigating these kids having guns. You have no one on site to respond in a quick enough manner to deal with it, where seconds could be the difference between one kid dying or 10 kids dying. All of these things matter. If you perceive a little bit of danger, you guys go ahead and cover your own selves by me raising my voice. There's more than enough perceived danger here to understand that you need to protect these children at all costs. Stop concerning yourselves about their sexualities and things about their psychosis and all this other stuff. Let's get to the basics of safety first. Once you feel safe, we can worry about the trauma that we have to fix because you guys have induced it. Sorry that you guys don't understand. You all have kids. Some of you do, some of you don't, but you don't understand these basic concepts. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Our next speaker is Holly Cumbie. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Holly Cumby, and I'm a teacher at Brook Hill Elementary. Um, I, at this time of year, I start to get really nervous because we start hearing about budget cuts. Um, it's when we hear how many full-time teachers we're going to have for next year, cutting positions, shuffling of classes. Um, and um, so I just want to continue to advocate for small class sizes, no combos. You know, we're very concerned about safety and student success. You've heard it from many people already. And as you know, it's much easier to keep our students safe and meet their needs when we have smaller classes. Um, this year, I was really lucky to have 17 students in my class. And I honestly feel much more successful at meeting their needs and um, seeing growth that I haven't seen in years where I've had 24 first graders. Um, and then also teaching a combo with no support, it basically equates to crowd control and is just really not an optimal learning environment for our students. Um, we currently at Brook Hill have one part-time reading teacher, which takes a huge chunk of our site funds. And a part-time teacher is really falling far short of what is needed. I was wondering if we could consider having a full-time reading teacher at every site, partly funded with site funds and matched by the district, just a suggestion. Um, and then on a different note, I would really just encourage you to proceed with caution when touting that suspensions are down in the media. This paints a very rosy picture that I don't feel reflects our current environment at schools. Because if you ask any teacher, the ones that are on the front lines, I suspect that they will tell you a different story since um, we're experiencing violence, aggression, and increased behaviors. Um, I also want to advocate again, like others, for more mental health support and behavioral support for students with um, special needs. I don't want to share specific incidents publicly regarding violent incidents um, with students at my school, but we've been experiencing um, assaults on teachers with uh, students as young as kindergarten um, and having our are um, asked for help ignored. Um, so I just, um, even though suspensions are down, I don't feel that we're safer. I don't feel that students are, um, you know, any better off right now. So again, we just need more help, more support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cumbie. Our next speaker is Scotty Santina. Hello, board. Um, thank you so much for this time. Um, I am another combo teacher who is um, who would like to just talk about some of the issues and um, hopefully help come for, come to some solutions. So earlier we heard from some of the most exemplary educators uh, uh, from different schools, educators that sub during their preps, 
educators that stayed before and after school to fix programming gaps, educators um, that take on extra work because we are short staffed and we do not have even the amount of bodies we are supposed to have on our campuses. And while I want to celebrate those educators and while I want them to have their moment, I do just have to point out the duality of this, that we are celebrating people doing multiple jobs because we are not providing, the district is not providing the support that we need. Um, I wasn't even gonna talk about combos without supports, but I would love it if we could look into ways to incentivize the most experienced teachers to take on combos instead of it being the teachers who are temporary, the teachers who may or may not be returning, the teachers who do not have the same funds of knowledge that people who have been doing it for 10 or 20, or in some cases, 25, 30 years can. Um, I meet with my students in small groups at, at my lunch sometimes, just so that I have a time to actually get to be a human being around them and not focus on so much management. Um, it took a month for me to get a response from some of you um, about some of my earlier safety questions. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad we got to that point, but I, I would really request that we have more updates about um, the safety committee and the actions that they are taking. Um, I would also like the, the district to look into backing up Parent Square Communications. Um, I need to give a shout out to Elisa. She is one of the only people from the district that I have seen um, this year who has actually come to our campus. And I just want to encourage parents, teachers, um, support staff, everyone, start reading the LCAPs. Start reading the LCAPs and let's make sure that, the, that everyone is doing their part to make sure that we are providing a successful education um, for our children. And I just wanna end by saying, I do love this area. I love the students I work with. I love Monroe. Um, and I, I would really like it if, you, if we can all work together on making our schools places where teachers, students, staff, everyone feels safe, supported, respected, and valued. If you, can go so, if you can go get a minimum wage job and make more than some of the people who work at a school, something's up, something's up. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And now our final speaker is Deanna Olivares. Hi, superintendent and board. Um, I'm I'm pretty exhausted. Um, this is probably my third year, almost probably coming to almost every meeting, um, putting in lots and lots of hours, and I'm kind of disheartened that we get three minutes today, because that means there's not very many people here in person or online. And that means that slowly parents aren't making this meeting a priority. Um, and that's unfortunate because as we all know, parents get, you know, a bee in their bonnet and they come and speak up to a bunch of meetings and then they slowly fizzle away toward the end of the year. And I'm just pleading with parents not to do that because our campus safety and our children's lives are at risk. I've seen many police officers on campus in the mornings when I drop off my kids. And when the police officer car is there, they kind of sigh with relief. When it's not there and it come and a, a police officer comes in the middle of the day, they get anxious. I get text messages saying, mom, there's a cop here. Mom, there's today there is eight motorcycle cops at Maria Carrillo. Do you know what's going on? These kids are stressed. And um, I don't know if you all know what happens when you're stressed, but I work in I work for a nonprofit that helps foster youth and adopted foster youth with trauma. And stress is is very bad emotionally, mentally, physically. It, it cre we don't have short term memory because of stress. These kids are stressed. These teachers are stressed. Um, the learning's not happening the way it should. The teaching's not happening the way it should. And we need to support our kids and teachers and help them feel safe on campus. Um, I'm pleading that this um, safety committee isn't a stunt like the SRO committee. I hope that you take the recommendation. 
I'm wondering what community members and nonprofits um, get a voice in this committee, uh, because I think if you don't have children in the district and you're not on campus working, you might not have, you might not really deserve a big say. I know community matters, but these are our children and teachers are at school. I think they need to, you know, they need to bear the brunt of this and they need to decide what we do. Um, I hope you put more adults on campus. Um, whether you like the police or not, we need adults. There's not very many adult volunteers. There was a knife again found yesterday on Maria Creo campus. I mean, it's it's never ending. It's it's scary, and we all might need to think of just pulling our kids from school in general if you guys don't step up. And is there any more speakers? I think Margaret Boone, one more, right? Hand was up earlier. After Margaret Boone, that's the last speaker. Thank you. Good evening. Um, in 2018, I spoke to this board and our previous superintendent about the impact of low wages on our classified employees. At that time, our lowest paid, paid classified employees were making just over $13 an hour, despite the minimum wage in Sonoma County being $15 an hour. Now those same employees make $16.17 an hour, while the current minimum wage in Santa Rosa is $17.25. While they are marginally closer to making minimum wage, they still do not. In 2018, I said, what would motivate people to apply for these jobs when baggers at Whole Foods make $15 an hour and fast food restaurants are starting at $11 or $12 an hour, the same as our childcare workers or yard duties. We need to pay living wages at least $15 an hour to make our classified staff a priority. Five years later, and now many fast food restaurants are starting at 18 to 24 an hour. A courtesy clerk makes 17 to 19.50 an hour. Target is paying 18.50 an hour to start. I've worked, sorry, I have worked as a courtesy clerk in fast food at Mervyn's, which was later bought by Target and as an instructional assistant. I will say in many ways, retail was easier. And as a union courtesy clerk at Safeway, I got time and a half Sundays and five triple paid holidays per year and amazing health coverage. Five years ago, I also said, my assistants are forced to take second jobs and live in low income housing. One drives for Uber after work and the other provides in-home care four nights a week. All of that is still true, except the one who drives for Uber has a different second job now. We have an assistant in our ESN program that hit that six year mark where they don't get a raise for four more years and instead they have opted to quit. We're losing six years of experience and a bilingual assistant. It's a huge loss. We currently have 140 classified openings in the district. That number hasn't dropped below 100 in longer than I can remember. In LA, there was a strike a few weeks ago to try to get a 30% raise for all classified staff and an extra 2% for their lowest paid members. That should be the kind of numbers we're looking at here as well. The MIT living wage calculator for Sonoma County says the minimum wage a person can make and survive is $21.14 an hour. Our lowest paid employees make $16.17. A 32% raise would bring them just above the minimum living wage for a person in Sonoma County. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move on to reports. Um, is there a CSEA uh, 75 report today? Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, good evening, President Manieri, Vice President Medina, Governing Board, Superintendent Trinell, guests, and everyone listening online tonight. We respect the concerns and ideas of those who have spoken in public comment. We want to congratulate the students, teachers, and classified staff of the month at Santa Rosa Charter School of the Arts and Santa Rosa Middle School. A special thank you to our classified staff, Alisana Sunia at Santa Rosa Charter School of the Arts and Brooke Wilcox at Santa Rosa Middle School. We thank you for bringing purpose and passion to your jobs, making a difference in the lives of the students you serve. 
CSEA would like to commend Lori Fong for stepping down as a board member and stepping up to be the principal of Montgomery High School during these trying times. Being the most articulate and experienced board member, we will miss her. Already her presence at Montgomery High School is slowly but surely turning the morale around. A shout out to Dean Haskins, hashtag this is who we are. What a positive way to work to together with the students, families, staff, and the community to handle the situation. And thank you to Jim LaFrance and all of the staff at Montgomery for the Unity Week video bulletin founded Parents Square this week. We are anxious to hear a report from Superintendent Trinnell about the Safety Advisory Roundtable, SART Committee, that was formed last week with the representatives from students, teachers, all staff, and the community. What is their agenda? What is being done now? What are the outcomes so far? Will all of us be included in the ongoing process? How often will there be updates? We are excited to see the details of all the summer programs planned for our school sites. How will safety be handled? Will there be campus supervisors? Will there be identical safety training at all school sites for all classified staff, teachers, and administrators? How will the substitutes be trained prior to substituting? CSEA supports the approval of the agenda item F8 tonight. We are proud that our classified members who submitted reclassifications for their jobs. It is important for all members to know this is an appropriate means for reevaluation of your job. The school board has an enormous job governing our school district and doing so in such a way that shows you are advocates for our students. As we enter negotiations this year, I would like to remind the school board that it takes a team to run the school district. We are part of that team. It is usually a classified employee who welcomes the students into the school first thing in the morning and makes sure they stay safe on campus in a clean and maintained facility and have safe playgrounds, engaging libraries, and are tended by a pair of her professional office staff and classroom instructional assistants. It is important to ensure those staff members are compensated accordingly to ensure quality education for the students of Santa Rosa School District. Treating our classified employees with respect and making them feel welcome as part of the larger team is a priority and will increase retention. We must ensure that our classified staff is compensated adequately and not below the wages of other jobs that are available in Santa Rosa. We need a living wage. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to our SRTA report. Lord, so I can see you guys. Good evening, uh, Vice President Medina, Superintendent Trinnell, members of the board, members of the public online and in the room. I'm Catherine Howell, president of the Santa Rosa Teachers Association, representing about 850 teachers in Santa Rosa City Schools. Uh, I always feel like I'm a little redundant by the time my report comes around, but here I go. I want to point out, I wonder how many of you know the California Constitution. I've never read it myself except for this one little piece. It says, all students and staff of public primary, elementary, junior high, and senior high schools have the inalienable right to attend campuses which are safe, secure, and peaceful. It's in the Constitution of California. 
And we've talked about it a lot tonight. We are looking forward to the SART committee report and hoping that that committee will be doing great things uh, as it moves forward. Um, but as we talk about school safety, we've heard about uh, other speakers tonight talk about wellness on campus, the need for family engagement, for restorative specialists. We need more campus supervisors. These things have all been said before. Um, but we also need to think about alternatives for educational programs. Um, Jonathan Moko talked about so many of the programs that aren't there anymore. Um, I would add that one of those is the middle school bridge program that was created without any input from teachers and disappeared uh, almost as quickly and quietly as it had come, leaving no alternative program for our middle school students. Uh, we know that our independent study program has a wait list pretty much all the time. Uh, we know that Ridgeway is at capacity. And even if you can get into Ridgeway, you can't do it until you're a junior and you can't go there unless you have enough credits, which leaves a heck of a lot of kids out there without really an option for an alternative program. I don't know how accurate these numbers are, but I've heard that there's a thousand juniors district wide right now that are not on track to graduate. I've heard that 70% of sophomores at Santa Rosa High School are not on track to graduate. Even if these numbers are wrong, even if it's only a fraction of that, how are we helping these kids? They're coming to our campuses, they're failing classes, they're getting no supports, there's no alternative ed programs to put them into, and the result is a lack of a peaceful campus, lack of a safe campus, and lack of a secure campus. Um, summer school, that's on the agenda tonight too. And soon an MOU will be coming to this board for approval that is giving summer school teachers this summer five hours of paid prep time. The first time ever teachers will be getting paid prep time for summer school. Doesn't seem like that big a deal, five hours a week, but it might be enough to lure a few more teachers in but it's not gonna be enough for 70% of our sophomores at Santa Rosa High School. It's not gonna be enough if there truly are a thousand juniors not on track to graduate. Um, the high school credit recovery plan over the summer can't be the backup plan. It can't be the only option. There's not enough teachers to do that. The teachers are exhausted and you know, five extra hours of paid time. It might lure a few people in, it might not, but it's gonna be really hard to accommodate all of the alternative options that these kids need. We know that student wellness leads to safer campuses. We know that um, peaceful campuses and student success is the key to this wellness. If we can see our students succeed, we will see schools that are thriving, um, but we're not seeing that. Uh, there's too many things that we don't have. We don't have the supports and the kids that really need the help don't have the options of alternative placements. So I'm asking you to please keep that in mind as you talk about safety. It's more than just more people. It's, you know, what, what actual supports are we giving to these students that they maybe used to have that they don't anymore? Uh, and how can we help them be successful as freshmen, as sophomores, as juniors, as seniors so that they can graduate? without relying on Ridgeway or summer school or the non-existent programs that we used to have in place to help them be uh, successful graduates. Thank you. Thank you for your report, President Hal. And now we'll move on to uh, Superintendent Trudell. Superintendent's report, please. Thank you, Vice President Medina, members of the board, those who are with us in person and online, welcome. Um, today marks day 148 for elementary schools and day 147 for our secondary schools. Um, I'd like to use my time tonight to provide an, an, a brief update on the safety advisory roundtable group. There were seven group interviews that were conducted two weeks ago, uh, two for students, two for parents, one for community members, one for staff, and one for district administrators. Out of the 84 applicants, 62 accepted interviews. 
out of the 62 interviewed, 30 representatives were offered a seat on the SART, uh, on the SART team. Originally, it was considered that we would have 18 members on this team. After the interviews, I determined that we should include more representatives based on what I heard from the participants in the interviews. The SART is made up of 30 representatives from the following groups, nine students. These nine students represent five high schools in ninth through 12th grade, eight parents representing elementary, middle, and high school, three community organizations, two classified representatives representing custodial and health support, three teachers representing elementary, middle, and high school, three site administrators, all representing high schools, two district administrators representing student and family engagement. We've had one meeting so far and we'll be meeting weekly um, into June as a start. We will be discussing the potential of subcommittee work in our next meeting this week. We have four pillars of focus for the design of a strategic plan. One, safety and security. Two, mental health and counseling. Three, communication and transparency. And four, facilities. We began, we began our work in our first meeting by considering priorities for safety and security. I will soon be publishing our first set of work as a committee for the public to know um, and to be able to see our progress. So we'll be start, we are going to start sending that information out so that you will know where we are and as we begin to form uh, recommendations. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to you, Vice President. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Chanel. Um, we'll move on to board member reports. Are there any board members that have reports? Dr. Sheffield? Something to just add. I just want to say it was, it was a great uh, time at uh, CCLA, Cesar Chavez Day celebration on the 31st. Um, my aim was a bit off, but I spent um, plenty of money trying to dunk Anastasio to have our rose. And, um, and I, I um, did uh, dole out quite a bit of money um, to see Trustee De La Cruz uh, dunked by her child. It was pretty amazing. It was a great turnout. Um, lots of folks from the community, the school community, just so much pride. It was just a, a, a great event. I loved being there. Um, loved seeing all of the, the smiling, happy faces of the students. Just wanted to share that. Any other board members? Um, I didn't have to spend too much money. <laughs> My aim was pretty, pretty good. Um, you were right there. I stepped back, you know, I was on the mound. Uh, well, <laughs> I went where they told me to. I think it was on my third shot that I got the my sun dunk was in. in. My eyes, and it was a hot day. Um, but also, it was uh, good to be at the first start meeting. Um, uh, Clerk Flores, as well as myself, we were present to welcome all the members of the SART team. Um, and then, oh, allow them to do their work. And I look forward to seeing um, what's to come. Um, but if there's no other reports, we will move on to, um, is there any CSBA report? None. Um, is there a migrant ed report? Okay, we'll move on to the migrant education report. Good evening. Share my screen. Presenters are online. Go ahead when you're ready. All right, well, good evening, President, uh, Superintendent Chernell, Vice President Medina, board members, community who are there and online, and Kathy Fry, our admin, will be joining us shortly. My name is Jessica Hernandez. I am the migrant at Tosa for our migrant ed program here at Santa Rosa City Schools. Hello, I am Kathy Fry, the program coordinator for state and federal programs and migrant education is one of those programs. Um, tonight, 
we are going to be presenting about a number of different items. Uh, um, we'll be talking about our students, uh, our programs, uh, um, the student, the number of students that we currently have in our program, how it is that those that number has changed, the innovative programs that we have put in place to be able to enhance academic achievement, the innovative projects that Jessica has um, put in place in relationship to her administrative program. And she will soon be a full-pledged administrator uh, um, and our family engagement activities and meetings and how it is that that also has increased. Uh, um, we will also be addressing our summer school in collaboration with uh, Director of Expanded Learning. And last but not least, we will be talking about the school year 23-24. One of the exciting things that has been happening is that we have been increasing our numbers. And the reason why we're increasing their numbers is because there are more migrant students coming to the area. Um, the, uh, our students and how they are involved in enhancing their education um, has definitely also been an attribute to how it is that others are involved. Uh, um, since December, when we last presented to the board on migrant education, our numbers have increased by roughly 20, 29%. Our largest number of migrant students are still at the secondary schools. Uh, um, and we do believe that the increase in the number of students has to do with a couple of different factors. Uh, one has to do with the fact that there are more migrant students uh, um, moving into the community. Um, second, it has to do with all the reach, outreach that we've been doing. Uh, um, there's been communication and information provided to principals, directors, registrars, elementary school office managers, and family engagement facilitators. Their response has been to further support our program, which has been uh, um, greatly appreciated. The and I think that I'm going to hand it on over to when we when we look at the number here um, we have for elementary, we have 115 elementary and charter school students, um, and we have 200 secondary students. The highest concentration for elementary is at, still at James Monroe. It, Cesar Chavez and Luther Burbank. Luther Baby. Burbank does actually have the highest number right now and the highest concentration of migrant students at secondary it includes Hillier Comstock Middle, Elsie Allen, Montgomery, and Piner High School. In addition to what it is that we've been doing, which Jessica will soon be explaining to you, we have been doing Pasito Scientificos, which is for preschool students, which has allowed us to also uh, um, do provide outreach and instruction and parent and family engagement to 23 preschool students. I'm going to be talking to you about our after school, an update about our after school intervention support. We are continuing with um, using our or having that partnership with our Santa Rosa City School teachers and the migrant at Tosa myself, coaching them and guiding them through our requirements for our program. Our sessions have integrated ELD, math, ELA, and self pride and cultural awareness. Here's some photos of this, are some of our students, and as you can see on the right hand side, there's the final product of our students math of work that they did and right below, you can see how she was doing her math um, guided by Joel Bowlers. And so she was doing her math activity and then that's our final product. The one down below is one of our uh, elementary students and it was on um, reading text and then finding the key details that help that student answer the questions and then be able to color that frog, that was like kind of the reward. Um, there's a chart here, our table of how our sessions went, the breakdown. So for our fall session, that was more of a hybrid model. So we had some virtual classes and we had some in-person classes where we were able to recruit teachers to support us. We had a number of seven teachers supporting us for the fall session with 38 students participating. We had 58 students who we, who we invited to the program, but only 38 did participate. 
So that was like a 65% participation rate. Out of those students, um, we had 29 of, the, of those 38 students, 29 of those students were participating virtually. And in that session, 15 out of the 38 students met the 30 hour goal. So that was a 39% um, success rate in terms of meeting that 30, 30 hour ELA goal that we have for our program. For our winter session, we really focused on in-person and recruiting more teachers. So we recruited one more teacher. And with that, we were able to have 51 students participate. We invited 55, 51 were able to participate in person. Out of the in-person students, currently only 14 of the 51 students met the 30 hour goal for mathematics. That's only a 27%. Even though we had a higher number of students, the participation rate with them being absent or the lack of transportation really um, hinder their success in meeting that 30 hour goal. And so for our third session, we really focused on trying to get those students that were close to meeting that 30 hour goal, either in ELA or math. And so currently we have four teachers supporting us with that. And we have 22 students that were invited to continue on so that we could um, meet, so that those students can meet the 30 hour goal. We asked more teachers, but because of the requirements that our program has, they opted to finish the winter session and not continue with us for the third session. Um, one of the things that we did this year that was a pilot, we did a professional learning community. And so we invited three teachers from different sites one from CCLA, one from Biela, and the other one from Lincoln to participate with me in a focused learning community. And so we focus on identifying a problem of practice for our MigraNet mathematical intervention program. And so we, the data that we used was the CAPS, CAPS uh, math scores for 21-22. And while looking at the data, we realized that in the categories of word, of word problem solving and data analysis, our students' score, scores were significantly higher in comparison with their Santa Rosa City Schools counterparts. And so our students score nearly or below was 95, 97% score near and nearly and below the standard for problem solving and model data analysis in comparison with our Santa Rosa City School students who scored at 90%. And so we really focused on that and what strategies we incorporated were um, based on our, our um, professional development that we received this year through Jeff Sweers, uh, through the multilingual department. And so we really focused on construction conversational skills and really building the idea and having multiple ways for the students to uh, show the way that they were working in and analyzing that data. And then we also focused on Joe Bowler's growth mindsets in, math in mathematically, mathematics because both of their concepts really focus about having the students talk, building an idea, and then showing them different ways of coming to the, to the same, um, solving the same problem. And so that was one of our focus so that next year when we go and start math interventions, we wanna take these ideas and really have students talk more, use those strategies, and hopefully that will give them more practice so that those scores can increase. Uh, another program that this year we've started, um, this was one of bigger one, one of our bigger challenges for me, just because I don't have as much secondary background. So it, it was a great collaboration of learning between counselors. Um, the sole counselors from the multilingual department provided a lot of support and then um, everybody involved. And so in Cyber High, I had to learn a little bit of the platform and then we were finally able to get the program running. And so our program focused primarily because it was it was a pilot program and getting getting everything ready. We focused on your 11th and 12th graders to help to support those who were credit deficient. And so we started March 7th and it will be ending on May 25th. And the schools that were were participating are participating are Montgomery High, Santa Rosa High, Piner, Elsie, and Ridgeway. In this program, we have two day in person sessions and then one office hours where the teachers can support, can zoom in with the students, uh, answer questions via email, phone calls. And so currently we have 
21 students out of the 31 that we invited to participate. And so they are working towards, and one of the requirements is that we, we expect our students to be working on these online modules, seven and a half hours a week, so that they can progress those seven and a half hours, obviously take into account those two hours in-person sessions that they are working with the teacher. And some of those courses are offered in Spanish. The only course that is not offered in Spanish currently are their English courses. And then with Pasito Cientificos, if that's our bilingual pre, uh, preschool readiness program for three and four year olds, so we're getting our preschoolers ready so that if those who are TKers can start TK ready and then our kindergartners can be ready as well. And so our winter session, we currently have 12 students and will be our last day will be on, on April 22nd. And it's going to be in person and Principal Diaz was kind enough to let us have our in-person class there at CCLA. And so Maestra Sandoval is our kinder bilingual teacher. And so she really wanted our students to have that experience of being able to be in a classroom and see how it kind of looks like a kinder classroom so that they're, they'll be ready. And so part of the program, I will also be there and will provide a training for parents to have them continue working on letter sounds, letter formations, and some of those concepts and prints so that what the students have gained so far, they can continue during the summer and be ready for those who are starting PK or kindergarten next year. And so some of the, as you can see some of the work here is, and that we focused on, or Maestra Sandoval focused on was pre-literacy skills, sounds, you know, the five senses, science, fine motor skills. So you can see Miguel's uh, work right there. He did Plato and worked on, you know, his, his, letter, his letters in his name. Um, we have one of our students there who's talking about the five senses and she recorded herself. And then um, the other little young man, he is in, in the recording in Seesaw, he did this beautiful painting of the rainbow, but he's actually recorded himself talking about the colors in Spanish and English and then just kind of his techniques. So they're gaining a lot of skills and getting ready for TK and kindergarten. And for our Pasito Científico program, the requirements for students to only meet 15 hours the whole year. And so the first fall session, we had um, six out of the 10 students who we invited participate. And then for our next, for this winter session, 12 out of the 12 students that we invited participated. And so we we're very excited that we had more kids participate as parents learned more about it. And now I'm going to talk to you about my my parent advisory committee. So this is a very um, collaborative piece that it's hosted by the Butte County Office of Education. Our program, Santa Rosa City School, with me, my, the migrant at Tosa, and now our new uh, member, who's our family engagement. Our last um, parent meeting was on March 30th, and we focused on celebrating our migrant ed families in commemoration of Cesar Chavez Day. Especially, I. You know, I was a CCLA teacher, and so Sosa Chavez Day is very dear to my heart. And so we really wanted to celebrate our parents here who are our migrant parents, right? And so this meeting really focused on empowering them and really acknowledging and celebrating them. So for this meeting, we had the four, four C's come and present about their trauma-informed series, about their child care stipend that they had. And we had 10,000 degrees come and talk to parents about college readiness, financial aid, and you know, no, regardless of their status, that all the opportunities that are there for their children. Um, we had our summer program. So Adelante, for Adelante, Isabel Quinones came and talked to the parents about the program. I commented a little bit about our program um, plans so the parents were aware about, about all these wonderful plans that we have for summer for our students. And um, one thing that has been, um, discuss and our migrant ed office, um, Butte County office staff has said that our program has one of the highest parent participations. We always currently average at 20 to 25 parents. And so it's pretty amazing that we have our parents come and, you know, take participant, participate and give us feedback in terms of how our program is doing and what kinds of things they would like to learn more about. Um, we also have a parent who represents us in our regional parent advisory committee, what we they call RPAC, and that 
committee meets once a month with all the representatives of the different regions and they discuss more things about our program. And so we were lucky enough that our representative Alejandra Rodriguez is not only our representative for our PAC, but she was chosen to be our, our parent who will be representing the whole region, region two of our program as they revise and create the new migrant ed profile and give feedback in terms of the requirements and programs that they like to see to the California Department of Education. And that meeting will be taking place this week. And so I have no doubt that she's gonna represent as well because she has great ideas. Um, she understands our students, our families, our community. Her daughter graduated from LC and is now attending Sacramento State. So she's gonna be a great advocate for our region and for our, our school, our school, our district as well. And um, lastly, our last meeting will be May 25th. It's at 6 p.m. It's via Zoom. And so I want to invite anybody, the board members and anybody who would like to join us so that you know, you can get to hear and, and get to know our parents a little bit more in terms of our PAC committee. So everybody's welcome. It's via Zoom and we, we welcome you. And the very last thing I have to tell you is about our family engagement piece. So. You know, it's a collaboration between Migrant Ed, regional staff, myself, the Migrant TOSA, our Migrant Ed facilitator. That is a new position that we had that was much needed for our program. And so our family engagement facilitator supports us in engaging our preschools to 12th grade families. She ensures, along with me, in creating at the beginning of the school year, our individual learning assessment surveys that we do for our families, our individual learning plans for our students, and that those get updated as as the needs for the students change. Um, she supports us with participating, with getting our students to participate in these programs because, you know, apart from having them and engaging them to come to the programs, we also wanna make sure that they're coming actively so that they can meet those requirements that are part of our, our program funding. And so um, our family engagement also helps us to inform our parents of our programs to, remind the parents of our parent advisory committee so that they can come give feedback uh, and show us and tell us of different ideas to make this program better because it is their program and she supports parents with referrals to other programs because apart from our educational piece part of our migrant ed, it is to help the whole child the whole family and so if parents are struggling with certain things we're able to provide referrals to other agencies where um, maybe we're not able to support them but we can find those connections with them. And our family engagement also helps with recruitment so that we can build our numbers. Okay, Migrant Summer School. Uh, um, Santa Rosa City Schools provides so many opportunities to students during the summer. And each year from my perspective, it keeps getting better. One of the options for migrant elementary school students will be taking place at Luther Burbank Elementary School. Learners whose teachers believe that they would benefit from expanded learning, which includes our migrant students, do have priority access to this program. Thanks to the leadership and collaboration with our new director for expanded learning, Michael Reimer, there will be a seamless transition from a morning summer academy to a migrant summer school program in the afternoon. And not only that, in the later afternoon, those migrant students whose parents choose to continue their student summer school opportunity for a few more hours will also have the option of joining the Boys and Girls Club. Our migrant summer school program will include teaching and learning, English language arts, English language development, and mathematics. For English language arts and English language development instruction, it will be an integrated thematic curriculum focused on the environment and, eco and ecosystems using um, collaborative curriculum design and FOSS science kits. Our math, it will be project-based learning where students will have hands-on experiences to work in small groups and develop meaningful projects that are also integrated thematically. The mindset of self-respect and cultural pride will be an integral part of the learning experience throughout that whole summer. And the, the other great thing about the summer school program is that there has been an additional week added on. Last week, there was only four weeks of summer school. This week, there's five. 
Um, the I think that is also going to be a better collaboration because of the fact that we have Boys and Girls Club supervising children as we are going as we are doing the transitions from summer academy into migrant program to Boys and Girls Club. Next. And um, a thanks to the Secretary of the Board, Ever Flores, who has been the principal of this program for many years. I don't remember the number of years that you had said last time we met, but um, it, yeah, I remember it was many. This program is hosted and facilitated in collaboration with Santa Rosa Junior College. It will continue this year as it has continued for many years. In this program, sixth through 12th grade migrant students from different areas in the county, including Santa Rosa City Schools, will be um, learning about and engaged in academic um, learning to accelerate their English language arts, English language development, mathematics, and science. It's also an opportunity for high school students to gain more credits to graduate. And much like the elementary program, self-respect and cultural pride in being a migrant and Latino is woven into the whole program. As we are closing this school year, we're also planning for the 23-24 school year. Every year, all migrant education programs have to develop a district service agreement. Last year was a complete rewrite of the program that we originally had in place. It was a good year to make this happen. Both Jessica and I were new to the program. It was an opportunity to look at what had been offered in the past and expand the services that had been offered. This year, we are, are strengthening that plan we created last year, which has been running this year, as we roll over our plans and make minor adjustments. As part of Region 2, we're under the umbrella of Butte County. Throughout the school year, the regional director and county director host meetings and summits. Yesterday, we learned of some re recent legislative changes for migrant education. And some of the mentionables include classified staff. And it can be hired to offer English language arts and math. Most likely we would be um, pairing this with teachers, uh, but it would allow classified staff to also work with our migrant students and it might enhance and expand our program some. Spanish language service for newcomers will be something that we can be offering. We, we will be having an increased emphasis on out of school youth, students with limited or interruptions in their formal education, Many of these um, young adults come to the United States lacking the language or the academics that they um, could have had here in the United States, and they want a job. And so there's different programs that have been recommended to be able to enhance their experience in being here in the United States, in being an adult, um, in developing their skills and more collaboration between districts is being encouraged. So there were thoughts yesterday at the summit that we attended about districts um, sharing information, but not just sharing information, um, thinking about how it is that we can be creative with sharing some of the programs that we do. Go ahead. So, um, one of the things that we've seen is that there's an increase in the number of migrant students coming to our county. And I don't think that that's just happening as it was explained to us yesterday also in our um, summit that there's an increase throughout the count, throughout California. And there's also an increase in um, the number of homeless students. Under the McKinney-Vinto Act, many of our migrant students are or could be classified as homeless. The primary way that they could be classified as homeless is the way in which many of our families are doubled up. Housing in Sonoma County is expensive. Housing throughout California is expensive. Um, 
the needs that we have for migrant education continue to grow as the numbers continue to increase. Jessica and Chatty Arnold, who is our homeless and um, foster youth family engagement facilitator, have talked some about how it is that we might be able to work with each other and to find out more specific data to be able to share with you so that we can illustrate the importance of these programs and how it is that we can collaborate with each other. And the increase in the number of migrant students equals the the need for continued and increased support. And we thank you for your support. With that, we lead with questions. Um, we open the floor to all of you. See, well, this is agenda it's just a report, not discussion item. So I think we just move on, right? Um, Clerk Flores, you had a question. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. I mean, for your very thorough uh, presentation, uh, and I, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times before that um, you know, alongside the uh, uh, the the story and, and 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 the type of programs that we have here, it would be a, important for us to know, you know, the, the data behind this, right? So, for example, you mentioned that twenty-one students were participated in the, in the Credit recovery program. You know how many students have been identified with credit deficiency. You know, and 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 you know how many of those are you know being are being targeted for for this program. Like you know, that's information that is important for us to know uh, as a board, right? So to see what sort of other support services uh, we need to put in place to make sure that we are targeting a larger sort of you know net. Um, also. I like to know how many of them I'm, I'm actually are actually completing credits as well, right? So um, we have students who are in a in the credit recovery program, and I like to know how many of those students are actually receiving, you know, either partial credits or full credits. I mean, that information will be important to know, and in, in the totality of how many students have been identified uh, with credit deficiency. Um, would, and go ahead. I would first like to respond, and then um, I invite Jessica. The One of the things to note about credit recovery is that the credit recovery program that we offer is supplementary. The high schools also offer that credit recovery program. The I think that you're right. I think that it's a good idea to get information data out there as to how many students, especially 11th and 12th graders, need that additional support. Um, and I think that the more that we collaborate with principals, uh, the more that that can happen. Right. Um, sec second, I just wanted to note that in regards to the um, credit recovery and the actual, how many are actually completing it, it this program started it back, it, it's a 10 week program. And Jessica, please do remind me when did when it did begin, it, it began in, began in March. And so we are barely maybe halfway through. And so we, I could get that information, but I don't have it currently. Um, one of the things that was difficult in terms of recruiting for students is because some of our migrant ed students are already receiving credit recovery cyber high through their counselors at their sites. And so these were the students that needed additional cyber high credit recovery. So yes, I mean, I understand that. So thank you. Uh, so having that information presented to the board will be important for us to have. Um, so we, we, we can see the context of uh, the report, right? And how many students are being affected in terms of uh, credit recovery and how many students are targeting, right? And, and what sort of things we can do systemically as a school board to make sure that students are supported and what sort of things we can implement to make sure that uh, not only students, but high school counselors and, and support staff are supported at each site. So, and then now there is a correlation you mentioned of, of you know, uh, a lot of our migrant students being identified as homeless, right? Because of the um, doubling up, even in double occupancy, you know, sort of homes. Um, are they being, you know, identified as Bento uh, McKinley? And then if so, you know, are, are we making sure that AB, you know, 1806, which 
you know, allow students for a reduction of graduation credits are being, you know, um, tagged on students to make sure that they fulfill graduation requirements. Um, yes, I, would like that, to see, I would like yes, to see that, more data on that. Okay. That's, that's a reasonable request. And I think that it's one that can be delivered in the future. Yes, they, they are being identified. Um, the even when students are are not identified on Aries, when principals call us in our office and let us know that they have that has just been reported, not all families want to report the fact that they're homeless. Um, it's not something that all people want to share. Um, so the. It, uh, right now, we're also working with a program for our foster youth uh, called Foster Focus. And between Foster Focus, CalPads, which provides us with information on our homeless uh, um, and our ELs, uh, um, we would be able to combine that information. And that's the work that I'm talking about when I talk about how it is that homeless and foster youth and migrant education could be working with each other to be able to provide more data. Um, so that is something that is foreseen in the future. Right. So I'm just saying, statistically speaking, we have, you know, information that tells us that our students uh, who or students who happen to be homeless, uh, foster youth or, or migratory families have a higher, you know, uh, dropout rate due to lack of credits. Right. So if we are proactively making sure that these students are being identified to make sure that they're tagged in our system uh, as AB you know, 1806, uh, this is something that I would love the district to work with you in terms of making sure that this, uh, our students are being properly identified um, so, that we, uh, so that we can scaffold the graduation requirements. So um, that's, the, that, that's something I would love to hear in our next meeting uh, from uh, not only you, but our district. Uh, to make sure that you know we're doing a systemic sort of approach uh, to see what sort of support systems we have in place uh, for these particular students. And um, that's all the uh, questions I have. Thank you. Director Sheffield. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen, Jessica, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, Kathleen talked about the increase in participation. Um, I think it was 29% um, that's due. Yeah. In 20, okay. uh, due in part to um, an increase in migrant students in the district, but also because of the greater outreach and family engagement that you do. So I just want to applaud the work that you're doing. Um, this is obviously a big factor and it allows the district to better meet the needs of more and more of our students. Um, so con continue with the work that you're doing. Um, I did have a question around the migrant summer uh, program and how many, how many slots or how many spaces? Right now, um, due to our budgeting, we have what we do not have. Personally, I think that we would love to be able to have more. Yeah. We're having three uh, classes. We're having a, for the migrant program, we're having a K-1, two, three, and four, five. They are grade combination classes because we do not have the funding <clears throat> to be able to provide six different classes. Uh, um, the, uh, so you had asked about the, uh, how, the number. I'm sorry, the number. And so right now, uh, our numbers uh, were reflected in one of the slides. I don't have it in front of me, yeah. um, but the we're trying to re do outreach with our family engagement facilitator to the parents to get as money as we can. Last year, we probably got about 70% of our students who were involved because they have many different opportunities, which is not a negative, it's a positive. Uh, um, in Santa Rosa, uh, the uh, some parents choose to take their students to other places, which is fine. Uh, they have that choice. Uh, um, so uh, we're hoping uh, that there will be uh, 25 uh, um, in each class. Okay, and and I guess with that, the, the anticipation is that these slots will fill up. We won't. The, every, there's there's a there's a need, um, and. There and I think that because there's been that collaboration with yeah. the director of expanded learning, and it is going to be such a seamless program with support from Boys and Girls Club and the support from the Sunmar Academy, I think that it's um, more aligned with each other this year. Okay. And so, and you I say the hope is seventy percent of the participants now will just carry over into the summer. Yes. That's, okay. That's Thank correct. you. We have 100. We you do have 115 <clears throat> students, but we will prioritize because we have priority of service students first, and then our other students as well. But all who can will attend. 
115? Yes, that's what we currently have in elementary. Okay. And, but that does include sixth grade and sixth grade will go to Adelante. So that's true. Um, they, yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Now, um, the only other thing that I would ask is if uh, that was a very good, detailed, in-depth presentation report, um, if maybe you could send it to superintendent so we could have it for the minutes. Appreciate it. Um, with that, we'll move on to E items, um, starting off with E1, a resolution support of National Sexual Awareness Month. Thank you, Vice President Medina. I would like to welcome our Verity uh, guests down to the table as I begin. April is National Sexual Assault Awareness Month, a time dedicated to raising public awareness about sexual violence and educating communities on how to prevent it. Victims of sexual violence often find themselves isolated without support from family or friends and in need of medical and legal services. National Sexual Assault Awareness Month has been organized since 2001 through the nonprofit National Sexual Violence Resource Center, building on long-term efforts to support victims that date back to the 1970s and earlier. This year's theme is Drawing Connections, Prevention Demands Equity. This April's campaign calls on all individuals, communities, organizations, and institutions to change ourselves and the, system, and the systems around us to build racial equity. And I'd like to have our guests please introduce themselves and share a little bit of information and welcome. Kush, that helps. Good evening, thanks so much for having us. Uh, my name is Chris Castillo. I'm the executive director of Verity. Hello, Ed, good to meet you in person. Um, and thank you again, Metzli. Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Metzli Perez. Hola, buenos, um, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Metzli Perez. And we just wanna thank you for this uh, proclamation. We feel it's critically important for all of the students in Sonoma County and especially in Santa Rosa, the work that we do that we've been able to collaborate with you to do um, over the past years has been important, critical, and has made a profound difference for both the students and their families. No, no, <laughs> we're trying, we were gonna do English and Spanish, but it's a little bit too much. So what's that? Oh, okay, great, then we don't have to worry about that. Metzli is one of our um, uh, advocates and she actually oversees um, our SART program. We have a SART program, but that's Sexual Assault Response Team program and coordinates all of the advocates that go out on accompaniments with youth. We also, through our prevention education department, have um, participated in the Adelante um, summer programs um, with youth. And the primary focus is to to address from elementary through college, actually, um, the, the core issues of sexual assault and sexual violence and to support youth in coming forward and disclosing because many of those situations that were addressed here today that you see with your students in school is because they're coming to school because they've been victimized by sexual assault, sexual violence, or witness it in the home, as well as domestic violence and domestic assault. And so the, as much support as you can give to your teachers is critical so that your students can flourish and grow. And as much partnering that you wanna do with Verity, we are more than welcome and more than happy to do. Would you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to go ahead and share what um, being an advocate is. Um, being an advocate is very rewarding. Seeing the student faces light up when they know they have the right to their advocate. We met them in their school and we are in every step of their um, investigation process. It is very rewarding to see them go from victim to survivor. Having a city school board that supports their local 
Trauma and Healing Center, it is very important for both the community and the students of Santa Rosa. I want to um, thank you all for your support and for recognizing April as um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Thank you very much. With that, I will just add thank you um, for being here and for being partners and for the work that you do. Uh, our resolution also includes the contact information for Verity in case there are individuals who need support. And with that, I hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'll ask uh, any board members, any questions, comments? Director Sheffield? Oh, I Director Flores. I just want to say thank you for your presentation and uh, I am looking forward to working with you in Adelante. You're always welcome to come to our summer school program. So um, looking forward to your presentation this summer as well. Thank you. We'll open it up for any public comments on this item. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on item E1, please raise your hand. Vice President Medina, I do not see any hands raised. Thank you. So now I'll bring it back to the board. Is there anybody who'd like to present a motion? Just thank just you quick. for being here. And then I just had a quick question if you guys were doing anything special this month or if it's just like an awareness thing to let everyone know about. Oh, we're doing a lot. If you go to our website, www.ourverity.org, you'll see the calendar and it's updated daily. There are quite a number of events, Dine and Donates. Um, we're partnering with Sonoma State University and the activities and events that they do. We're partnering with Crime Victim Awareness, Meet, Awareness Week, which is um, on April 29th. There's an event from 12 to 4 at the uh, Courthouse Square. So there's lots of activities and events. And if you go to our website, you'll be able to see those. Great, thank you. And is this also something that we're like sending out on Parent Square? Superintendent Turnell? Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McNally. Um, I just wanna thank Verity for being here. This is an issue that is very close to my heart. Um, and I also just wanna take a moment to say to any survivors in the district, whether you be student, staff, family, I just wanna say that you are not alone. And there are people here who care, and I care and yeah, and I motion to approve the resolution. Second. Moved by Director McNally, seconded by uh, Clerk Flores. Is there any additional comments? I'll just add, you know, one in four girls and one in six boys have been sexually assaulted before the age of 18. Um, young people who experience sexual violence may demonstrate sharp declines in academic performance, and uh, noticeable and alarming risk-taking behavior and low self-esteem. And the signs are there if we know how to identify them and anything that we can do to help. I just encourage all of us to just keep our eyes open and be aware and listen and, and make ourselves available. Thank you so much for the work that you do in the community. Thank you, uh, Director Sheffield. So any additional comments, if not, um, there's a motion on the floor, uh, motion to approve resolution 2022-2023-62, um, recognizing April as Sexual Awareness Month. Uh, could we have a roll call vote? Director Bowie. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Vice President Medina. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much. And we have a little um, handouts for each of you. We have your bracelets and information about us. And um, Joyce Galindo, who is our prevention education manager, gave you a little bit of an uh, overview about what we do and the programs that we have. So, um, Nestle will give those to each of you. 
Thank you so much for having us tonight. Thank you again. And now we'll move on to item E2, um, a discussion item on 2023 summer school. I will um, pass this on to uh, is it Mr. Raymer. Mr. Reimer is getting set up. Um, thank you for joining us, Mr. Reimer. He is one of our newest directors of educational services, and we're very happy to have him as a member of our team. And uh, thank you so much for your time this evening to present information to us about summer school 2023. Did I give you enough time to get the <laughs> presentation going? Okay, great. So uh, good evening um, uh, to Vice President Medina, uh, Superintendent Trinnell, of course, and uh, the trustee board members. Uh, my name is Michael Reimer. I'm the director of expanded learning programs and excited this evening to uh, provide uh, an update um, of our progress so far and also to give you a quick overview of the programs that we're going to be offering later this summer. Can you get a little closer to the mic? Sorry, is that better? Thank you. Yeah. So in terms of an update for us this evening, I've put together four different slides to highlight uh, key aspects of the work so far. First one that we thought we'd talk about is the talent. Of course, summer school is dependent upon uh, the hard work and efforts of um, many different departments and educators from across the district. Also wanted to mention up front that we've reviewed the feedback from the board from last year's summer school offerings and work to try to incorporate as many aspects of that feedback uh, into this year's development. One of those key parts um, that we had reviewed was an emphasis on beginning the hiring process as early as possible. Pleased to report out this evening that the, um, the interview and the hiring process began in February. And at that time we had uh, hired and recruited nine summer school principals to help lead five summer school programs. Pleased to tell you that this evening that we've hired two, per, two uh, summer school administrators per session for the high school credit recovery program. And also wanted to note that there are two different sessions. So uh, simply four uh, summer school principals assigned to those positions. We've also hired two uh, summer school principals for the extended uh, school year special education program, one for the migrant education program, one leader to serve for the K-6 Academy, it's the elementary program, and one summer school principal, of course, to lead the Sonoma State University Excel program. The hiring of those site leaders um, again started at the end of February and immediately after they were identified, our team worked with the human resources department to uh, train and update them on hiring practices so that they in turn could hire their teams. So the second point there is right now, pleased to report that principals continue to recruit and hire for classified and also credentialed programs, uh, positions for many of their programs. Second thing we wanted to highlight this evening was the support that we've been able to provide to um, different, different groups or different teams connected to the summer school work. And here we've broken up uh, our training and support in two strands. The first is to work with key district departments who are connected to, the, to uh, launching and scaling the work. This includes departments like transportation, student nutrition, budget, human, human resources, the key major district departments who are, are really uh, responsible in many ways to help bring this to scale and to do it quickly. So we've worked separately with those leaders and uh, worked to, of course, uh, get their input and uh, draw on their expertise and their teams. And separately, we've worked to train and support those nine summer school principals. And here we've held separate meetings, uh, which are held roughly every two weeks to stay in touch with them, to provide them with 
um, hopefully what they find to be timely supports and information as they uh, recruit and hire their team members and launch their programs. Those supports and those professional developments, those sessions that we've run uh, are tailored to uh, address uh, the needs and the timelines that are specific to their particular pieces of the work. So for example, we've thought carefully around transportation and the importance of enrollment uh, of students um, you know, to make sure that the transportation team has time to do things like map out routes for families. Final point on support there at the bottom is that we have also, um, you know, much of the work I've talked about so far is, is dealing with district staff members, uh, different departments or summer school uh, leaders. But I wanted to also highlight and celebrate the fact that we've worked with a number of external partners to develop and integrate different camp experiences into the overall programming. And just at the end of the slide, I'll, uh, before we get into the programs in a couple of minutes, I'll just mention is that we've got kind of got a blended program, I'd describe it as. A number of the summer school offerings focus on academics, while others um, are more enrichment or um, kind of self-discovery options. Slide here I wanted to mention is we've tried to also make a, a, a simple platform, a suite of resources, if you will. It's uh, called a quick start sheet, uh, has many links that uh, are connected for site leaders and also for district uh, department leaders. It's designed to be a one-stop shop to make sure that we're able to bring this to scale so that people can find resources quickly and efficiently um, and finally, that we're building um, over time uh, an inventory or a library of resources to, to build upon. The final part of the update I wanted to give you this evening is connected to opportunities. And in this aspect, I wanted to highlight uh, you know, two key ones, of course. Number one is the opportunities for our staff across the district. We have, uh, you know, at, at, as we've worked to bring this to scale and, and uh, develop those programs and hire key people, we've wanted to make sure that we are um, launching those opportunities broadly uh, across the district. So we have made several posts in the Communicado, the internal administrative bulletin that goes out on these openings to push out to their staff members and teams. We've also worked with the EdJoin website, of course, to post uh, some of the positions. And finally, if you check out the district's webpage on the, on the Staff Hub tab, you'll notice links to uh, a variety of different job postings for credentialed, classified, uh, and other staff members. Opportunities are not just listed, or not just, uh, sorry, restricted to staff members. Of course, at the same time, we want to communicate broadly to our parents and community members. Uh, the options or opportunities for their children to participate in the summer. And here, uh, we have communicated with our principals to get them to push out messages uh, for a number of weeks or, or maybe even longer now. Uh, via the Communicado. We have also launched the opportunities uh, at the beginning of April for all of our families, for all the programs on the district webpage and also via our social media channels. Finally, I just wanted to mention here at the end of the update that uh, we're gonna be celebrating the opportunities via radio. I don't know if uh, some people have heard uh, some spots on radio already and we're looking forward to uh, an interview tomorrow evening and also uh, via uh, the social media channels. So again, those four slides were just uh, giving a high level update on those kind of four key pillars to the work so far. And I wanted to pivot at this time to talk about um, a quick overview of the 11 different programs that we're planning to offer this year and to um, at the same time um, also show uh, projected financial impacts in terms of 
the different programs. And I'll just pause here on this slide and maybe also highlight this part at the bottom. There's an asterisk, uh, which is just designed to denote new or expanded offerings. So we're pleased to launch some new programs this year. And also at the same time, um, some, some ones that we've historically offered, we're pleased to grow out or expand this year as well. And then I'll just also note on the right-hand side, it's a projected financial expenditure. And it comes, of course, with a number of caveats. Uh, hiring is not completed. These projected numbers that you see entirely on the screen are based on weighted average salaries. So there could be variation depending on you know, exactly who's hired and their classification. But we did want to provide uh, you know, at least a, uh, a basic uh, projection in terms of um, ex expenditures that we expect for, for the overall programs this year. One other thing I'll just note, it's hard to see on this slide. I'm hopeful that the trustees all can take advantage of this. If you hover over the word overview and click it, it it's a link, uh, of course, and it takes you to this page which is available off of our district web page. And should you be interested in a, a more complete um, description or overview, including dates and times, um, you know, exactly which students each program is kind of targeting, uh, we invite you to uh, click on that and have, uh, have a read through that as well. And that concludes uh, the uh, presentation this evening. We, we had talked about a, just you know, quickly an, an update, those four aspects I thought were, were key to maybe uh, showcase today. And then also a brief overview. Uh, at this time, we open it up to uh, any discussion or questions. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, Clerk Flores. Hello there, and welcome to San Francisco City Schools. So, um, I have a few questions um, to um, proactively deal with issues that we have systemically dealt with in the past, especially for our, our extended school year. I remember, um, I think one of our attendees here tonight, um, Margaret Boone, you know, emailed us, you know, last summer with issues with transportation uh, and dealing with students who were not either picked up uh, and these were students with special needs uh, what sort of you know contingency plans do we have in case these were to happen uh, these sort of issues were to happen again so um, you know it you know that's one so and you probably don't have the answer to that but this is something that i think it's it, it's imperative for us to start working on that because you know having students not being picked up is it's 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 a huge concern to me right and as a summer school principal you know i also had uh, the same company because of the joint agreement that we have with them uh, and we also had issues with with, with lack of staffing and getting kids picked up on time so students could be in class to receive the instructional materials you know uh, or the instructional time um I, we had issues with the busing being late constantly i mean it wasn't five minutes it wasn't 10 minutes it was 30 minutes to 45 minutes so i, I want to make sure that we address these issues because it's it was uh, systemically it was systemic and it was uh, it was embarrassing to um to uh, to run a summer school program like that and i just want to make sure especially our esy students uh that we have it you know some sort of system in place in case something happens one of the he one of the things i heard last year and i think i talked to you about this last last year superintendent Turnell, is that the lack of staffing uh, from that company from west county uh, is there something that we can do to make sure that we have, you know, enough uh, staffing so issues like this don't happen this summer? 
Um, so I, I know I'm just giving you a lot of information right now. You weren't here last year, but this is something that has happened, you know, uh, quite often. Um, I don't know if you had the opportunity to talk to West County. I don't know if you know about this and what sort of um, um, systems in place do we have in case uh, this were to happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the questions. And I've taken some notes here and um, promise to follow up. Um, just quickly, I can address some of those things right now um, by letting you know that uh, we have been working with our transportation partners as a part of this uh, training and uh, launch for months now. So we have been in contact with um, the experts, um, our partners at that company and have um, talked through a number of situations, or, you know, um, uh, ideas up front to make sure that, you know, the, those, some of those um, concerns are addressed. The other thing I'll, I'll just quickly mention is, you know, the ESY program this year, we've wanted to help support. So uh, we've employed two uh, summer administrators for that program this year. So we've we've worked to think about that program with a lens towards supporting, you know, all parts of the extended school year experience from the students standpoint with additional administration at that site to help coordinate and and uh, get things ready. And then at the same time, we've worked to um, engage our transportation partners in good planning and preparation to make sure that those kinds of things don't happen. So I, I like to have maybe a follow up, you know, via, I don't know, um, it doesn't have to be a presentation again, but some sort of informational item for us to know what's happening in terms of proactively dealing with these issues. Uh, you know, as a, board, a school board member, you know, uh, one of my issues is that, you know, during COVID, you know, receiving a bill for $500,000 when we were not using transportation, and I get it, it was part of our joint agreement, right? But I mean, that sort of stuff, you know, irks me when we have issues in the summer for our summer school programs. So, um, so just, I just want you to keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you. If I may, there was one other aspect of the transportation that I just thought I'd quickly mention. One of the bits of feedback that we heard from the transportation team, specifically around uh, busing for the ESY program, had to do with staggering the start times of our summer school programs. And um, as soon as we heard that, I factored that in um, together with the administrators who we've hired for that program. And the way it was explained to us was, even a half hour offset between our uh, pre-K and elementary ESY program and the middle and the high school program. So separating those two bus strands uh, really provided um, an advantage to all of us around the busing issue for ESY. Now, so, what, yeah, one of the things, I also talked to some of my colleagues, other you know, uh, board members, uh, from Oakland, for example, and uh, they had issues like this in the past. And one of the things that they did uh, was to have a contingency plan in terms of, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily a Lyft or an Uber, but uh, some sort of, you know, um, secondary plan in case that were to happen, right? Uh, where students were being picked up. And obviously these folks have to be, you know, um, you know fingerprinted and in everything and in, in all that, right? So, but you know, um, that was an idea that I, you know, I heard from a couple of my colleagues in Oakland Unified. So um, I just want I just want us to to know, you know, that these sort of issues happen, right? And what are we doing in terms of making sure that we mitigate the, the uh, um, situation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Other board member questions? Just wanted to bring up something that not in the presentation. Thank you for the presentation, um, Dr. Reimer. Um, nutrition meals part of the program. Right, we have lunch lunches provided as always, and um, so just want to make sure that that's out there. You had mentioned um, a radio interview tomorrow. Um, what what station? I I I believe it's a KBBF. KBBF, yeah, yeah. Together with Superintendent uh, Trinell, 
So we're looking forward to, to celebrating the opportunities with the community and, uh, and talking about uh, how folks can get enrolled. Yeah, yeah, thank you again. I have a question. And this might seem, I don't know, I'll just put it out there. I guess I would ask, how would we describe as the goal or purpose of our summer school programs? The goal or the purpose? So, you know, I'd, I'd say that it varies depending upon, you know, which of the 11 programs I think we're referring to. If you ask me broadly to summarize it, I'd say that, you know, there's two key things for me that come to mind. Number one, I think that it's a focus on academics in many of the programs. So, of course, the pandemic has you know, impacted all of our learners at every level, elementary, middle, and high school. And I think that thinking carefully and critically around the students' needs and what we're seeing in classrooms and working to tailor and craft our summer school programs carefully and intentionally around what those needs, you know, is, is important. So, you know, I think of the the importance of the high school credit recovery program, serving the needs of students in 11th and 12th grade who are through no fault of their own, in many cases, you know, simply behind. We wanna provide them quickly now with opportunities to graduate on time. So, you know, the English, the mathematics, uh, getting back on track in terms of graduation is key there. The other one that I'll highlight academically that we've talked a little bit about this evening is the K-6 Academy, focusing a little bit, if you will, on the other end of the spectrum, the early learners, the importance of early literacy, and that particularly the K through three grade level, the reading and writing skills, which are just fundamental to you know, the, the rest of the K-12 experience. So if you look at this list, I'd say, a number of them highlight academics. But I would also like to showcase a couple of the other ones that I think are very important for some different reasons. And here I'd describe it as enrichment or additional learning opportunities, exploration. And so, you know, the one that I'm intrigued to learn more about myself, for example, is the mariachi camp and the arts program. I'm, I've already got their graduation celebration down in my day book. I'm looking forward to that showcase. I'm told that the Excel for Youth program, if you have a look at the course catalog, which you can find off the links um, as part of this presentation, has some fantastic um, uh, courses as well. Dinosaurs and uh, criminology for kids. Uh, it's kind of like a sleuthing or something like that coding camp as well. So these, these enrichment kinds of opportunities, I think are important, um, you know, as a, as a balance um, to, to the academics that we talked about earlier as well. And, and the second thing that I'd like to know, and it doesn't have to be right now, um, but just because I see a diverse set of offerings, but how much of it we're contracting out, how much is internal, um, so I'd like to know that, and it could be brought back in the future. Any other questions? Go ahead, Director Bui. Were you able to go more in depth, excuse me, about the high school credit recovery program? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Um, just... Were you able to go more in depth about the high school credit recovery program? Am, am I able to? Yeah. A little bit. So, um, you know, one thing I'll... I'll just maybe br briefly talk about as the asterisk that's noted there. Um, a number of weeks ago, the, the principal of the high school, um, high school credit recovery program emailed me and asked, she asked for uh, more staff, uh, more teachers. Um, she, of course, we're seeing demand for that. And uh, I immediately in our budget um, almost doubled the number of teachers in terms of a budgeting uh, line item. So we're trying to, you know, watch that program carefully and make sure that we're listening to the feedback that we're hearing from other leaders across the district to address student needs. And, and that was one way. 
And then I was just wondering on how to make it more engaging for the students. I've heard a lot of feedback in regarding where they just go on cyber high and they're just connected to their laptops or that's what they're pretty much doing for most of the time they're there. So just wondering how to make that more engaging so they're just not feeling like it's just like a task they have to do and they're actually engaging and learning. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'll, I can answer it briefly by saying this. I think that if you look at the high school credit recovery program, from what I've been told, there will be some different experiences there. Not all of them will be high school credit recovery online. Uh, some of them will be you know, in-person classes. So it, it won't all be cyber high, it could be a blend. So that's number one. Number two, I can tell you this is that when we interviewed site leaders uh, as part of the selection process, we listen very carefully to their answers around engaging students and their selection of teachers and other educators who really had a particular lens on engaging students in meaningful ways. Um, so I was impressed with their answers and I know that I'm sure they're working diligently now in, in picking their team members you know, around student engagement and exciting opportunities. Any other questions for Mr. Reimer before we move on to public comment? Seeing none, let's go to public comment. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on item E2. Please raise your hand at this time. Our first speaker online is Margaret Boone. Good evening. Um, <laughs> So assuming I'm hired, this will be my 12th year teaching extended school year. Um, I've actually taught summer school for the district for one year longer than I've taught as a hired teacher. Um, ESY is always a really fun time. We have 26 of our 29 students from the ESM program at Monty signed up. We used to be able to go to the Third Street Cinemas for really cheap movies that they would show just for us, but they were unfortunately taken out by the pandemic. And that was a huge loss. The last couple of years, one of our teachers, Jean Salazar, has worked hard to create opportunities for us to go see movie, a movie or two at the Roxy at a slightly discounted rate, but it's still very expensive. We also practice riding the bus. Another teacher, Lucinda Moore, gets us free bus passes for staff so we can support our kids. We go to the park, we cook, we go to the store, and so much more. We actually see Trusty Flores and his Adelante students every time we walk to Safeway or the park. We used to get a budget each year of $250, which went pretty far when I was hired in 2012, but that budget has been less the last two years. And it would be great if we could bring that back up or actually make it even more since groceries are insanely expensive now and we love to cook with our kids. Um, when we go over our budgets, we can do cool activities with our kids, that money comes out of our pockets. Additionally, the pay used to be a huge motivator for me to take on that extra month of work, but as time has gone by, the pay hasn't kept up with inflation, and it's really not much anymore. Um, we're under contract to be paid at the extended day rate, but in the future, keep in mind that's really not cutting it. We couldn't even get a SLP last year. Many teachers that teach ESY have a decade plus of experience, and we're making significantly less than we normally would. Um, <laughs> And so I also just want to say thank you to Trustee Flores for bringing up the bus issue. And I hope we don't have it this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Vice Terrible. President Medina, there are no other hands raised. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reimer, for your presentation. There's no more, any, any more comment? If not, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, next item is item E3. I will go ahead and pass this on to um, Ms. Lisa Cabin. Good evening, Vice President Medina, members of the board, Superintendent Trinnell, and members of our community. I would actually like to go ahead and turn this item over to Director Eric Oden. Uh, good evening. I uh, can repeat everything she just said, Vice President Medina, <laughs> Superintendent Trudell and Board. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. 
Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about uh, the adoption of resolution 2022-23-63, approving the lease lease back contract with white right contracting for the Brook Hill Elementary School, uh, Santa Rosa High School Modernization Project and Santa Rosa High School DeSoto Hall Project. Um, for some background, um, on November 11th of 2022, the district issued a request for proposals for the Santa Rosa High DeSoto Building and Brook Hill Elementary School Roofing and HVAC Project to the pre-qualified lease lease back contractors. On January 10th of 2023, the district received three responses to the RFP and re reviewed them against the best value criteria outlined in the RFP. On January 25th of 2023, the Board of Trustees approved the lease lease back pre-construction services agreement with Wright Contracting for the Santa Rosa High School Brook Hill Elementary School Roofing and HVAC project. In March of 2023, Wright Contracting, after advertising in compliance with Ed Code Section 17406, received subcontractor bids uh, to comply with the requirements set forth in Ed Code Section 17406, utilizing the district's pre pre-qualification list for mechanical, electrical, roofing, and plumbing subcontractors as required. Uh, this agreement includes the negotiated guaranteed maximum price for the project construction and the project timeline. The guaranteed maximum price for the projects shall be uh, for Brook Hill Elementary, $5,556,570. Uh, for Santa Rosa High School Modernization, $6,200,000. $68,664. And for the Santa Rosa High DeSoto Hall project, $3,910,535. Uh, before you today is a resolution 2022-23-63 to approve the lease lease back contracts with right contracting for Santa Rosa High School, DeSoto Hall building and Brook Hill Elementary School roofing and HVAC projects. Um, and we will now turn this over to the board for questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, do we have any board member questions? Go ahead, Clerk Florida. So um, the, the, these all fall purview under the PLA, right? I, I, agreement. And so my question, that's yes, right? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, my question to you is, um, briefly, how, how's that going in terms of um, the uh, project labor agreements and, and, and the bidding process? Uh, have we seen less, more um, bidding? Um, I, I'm just interested to hear, you know, in comparison to before the PLA. In re reference to this project specifically or to just well, in I mean, general? Yeah, let's talk about, about this project specifically, and then you know, I can bring this up in, 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 in some other projects. But I'm just curious to see, I mean, have we seen a, 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 a change or no change? I mean, do we have the same sort of bids? Um, you know, uh, because, I mean, we did get some opposition last time. I just want to, I want to hear your take on this. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, and I can only speak kind of more um, in the last six months or so as uh, from a facility standpoint, but um, I'm not seeing uh, much of a change, at least so far from what I could compare, you know, kind of looking back. Um, we, we are getting pretty good bids. I know that right contracting here got quite a lot of sub bids, um, all union uh, bidding on it. So uh, it helped keep that pricing competitive. Um, there was one project in particular that was at the board last uh, last time that only did get the one bid, but right, right. it was a smaller project, and I, you know, I think the the gauge of the interest uh, out there probably wasn't as high either, but it fell within estimated costs, so it, it it worked out pretty well for us. But I think so far it's been um, successful. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, let's move on to public comment. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on item E3. Please raise your hand. Our first speaker is Karen Wagner. Good evening, everyone. So I'm kind of concerned about why we are spending all this money on the modernization of the DeSoto Hall at Santa Rosa High School. It's one of the most beautiful buildings probably in our district. And I just left there and it doesn't seem like it needs to be modernized. 
We have buildings who are sitting with tarps that we could be using as classrooms for our extended um, 18 to 22 program at the district level over at Ridgeway. Um, you know, there is a need, we are a growing program. And to spend that kind of money when we can't even get a bungalow with restrooms for our special ed kids seems insane to me. So I would just like to state that doesn't make sense to the people in general. And our, our people, our kids deserve, our adults, they're going, they're in an 18 to 22 work program. We need a place to land. And I don't think this letter needs to be monetized. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Looks like there's no more uh, public comments. We'll come bring it back to the board. Uh, Clerk Flores. Yeah, I usually don't like to, um, you know, um, well, anyway. Um, can you tell us a little bit as to why, I mean, these are, are here? Not necessarily just one specifically, but I mean, wh why these are on our, our agenda? Uh, maybe that will address some of, some of the concerns from the public. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, th these are all um, by modernization, meaning uh, roofing and HVAC projects, right? So it's not, you know, DeSoto Hall is a beautiful building. Um, so this is strictly roofing, HVAC, and controls. So this is really about the comfort and um, sort of that safe, warm, and dry continuance as part of measure I and L. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Um, I have just one more thing, sorry. Um, so, it, it, you know, I, I hate to go back to this, you know, but, uh, you know, when we passed the PLA, we, we, we received quite a, quite a few opposition, right? And I just, I just want to, to reiterate the fact that um, what I'm hearing from, from the community is that it is working, right? Uh, I mean, I would love to see more bids, right, that we've uh, received, right? Uh, but, you know, it, it's not detracting from the bidding process. So, and that was one of the biggest arguments that we heard when we were debating whether or not to pass a PLA agreement, right? So I just want to say that, I mean, it sounds like to me, it hasn't detracted uh, from the bidding process. And uh, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, yeah no, we, especially for this job, um, both as a general contractor, we had uh, plenty of great contractors to pick from and then their subcontractor bids, they had a lot, so. They were able to uh, go through them all and, and make sure we got the best value. Well, thank you. Yeah. There's no more board member comment. Is there a motion? Anybody? Sure, I will. Um, I move to uh, move for adoption of resolution number 2023-2363, approving the lease back contracts with Wright Contracting LLC, yada, yada. <laughs> Second. Very lengthy. I'm sorry. <laughs> so moved to approve. Item is moved by uh, Director Sheffield, seconded by Clerk Flores. Can we get a roll call vote? Director Bowie. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Vice President Medina. Aye. Thank you. Now let's uh, move on to item E4. Thank you. This is acceptance of the 2021-22 Measure I and Measure L bond audit reports. Uh, Lisa Cabin again presenting, thank you. Yes, hello and thank you again. Uh, so just wanted to um, remind the board as to what these are about. We are required to have separate audits conducted for each of our bond measures. <clears throat> excuse me, so I and L were in place in 22. So these are audits of the transactions uh, recorded from July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2022. And I am pleased to report that again, there were no findings for either measures I or L or any question costs. Um, 
really the district has, has done a great job in um, maintaining the integrity of the intent of the language of the bond projects. Uh, this did go to our bond oversight committee for review. Unfortunately, the timing of it, we didn't have it in time for them to take formal action on that. It's not necessarily required. It is called out that they are required to review, but just as a formality, we will bring it back to them in May at our next meeting, but we are bringing it forward to you this evening. Are there any questions from the board or concerns? Sir Flores, you have your hand up. Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. Any other board questions? Seeing none, I will take it to public comment. For members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on item E4, please raise your hand. Vice President Medina, there are no hands raised. Thank you. With that said, is there a motion? I move uh, for acceptance of 21-22 measure I and measure L bond audit reports. Second the motion. Moved by Trustee Sheffield, seconded by Trustee McNally. Any further comment? None, we'll go to the vote. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Vice President Medina. Aye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to consent items. Before uh, we move on to actual consents, can we just uh, make sure that um, there's no one online that wants to comment on any of the consent items? We forgot to ask in the beginning. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on any of our consent agenda items. Those are the F items. Please raise your hand. I do not see any hands raised. Would anybody like to make a motion on the consent items? I would like to approve consent items uh, one through, I don't think I have to say this, but one through 12, 11. There's a motion, is there a second? Second the motion. Moved by Clerk Flores, seconded by Trustee McNally. Um, roll call vote. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Vice President Medina. Aye. Moving on to the minutes. Is there any, is there a motion or is there any amendments to the minutes? I'd like to uh, move to approve uh, the minutes of the regular board meeting held on March 29th, 2023. Second. Moved by Clerk Flores, seconded by Trustee Sheffield. Uh, roll call vote. Director Bowie. Director Flores. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Vice President Medina. Aye. Let's see, uh, board member requests for information. Are there any board member requests for information? I, I, I do. <clears throat> Go ahead, Clerk. Um, so, I think you already took note of this, uh, Superintendent, for now. Um, I, I think as a board, we were uh, a little bit, not a little bit, I think we're data driven. Uh, and, and I would like to see, you know, more, or I would like to see if we can have another data uh, informational sort of board meeting where we look at when we can look at graduation requirements, uh, the, the 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 progress that we've made, uh, the uh, scaffolding that we're doing, you know, in comparison to last year's presentation, uh, what's working, what's not working, what what we need to tweak, and that sort of stuff. So, because um, I I thought last time we had that it was really informative and. Um, uh, and I'd just like to see how we are progressing. Are there any other board member uh, requests for information? I, I have one. I'm kind of just formulating my head a little bit because I it came up tonight and I was just thinking about um, getting a maybe like a mid summer school program update at, you know during the summertime so we know how we are how we're standing and it's, it's a, okay. Yeah. What was that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, we don't have a... <laughs> Oops, yeah. that was Oops. my fault. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> 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 For, 
first thing in August. So I, I have maybe Go something ahead. else. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, something that uh, President Howell mentioned uh, about uh, I just I I'd just like to know what happened to these programs uh, that she mentioned, like you know the middle school program that came in and went away, um, the bridge, yeah, so, uh, the uh, middle school bridge program. Uh, uh, what can we do uh, with our independent studies program if it's if it's impacted? You know, uh, what sort of uh, do we need to hire more people? Do we need to uh, look at it differently? What sort of support systems do, do we have in place? And I, and I think I've talked about Ridgeway several times here before, and I'd like to have an update as to how that's going in terms of, you know, uh, big picture um, and the implementation of that program. Uh, and I mean, the number that, President Havel gave about a thousand students or a thousand, you know, eleventh graders that that are not on track for graduation. Uh, this goes in tandem with the uh, sort of information that I think it's it's very important for us to have. I like to know more about that, uh, those numbers. And there was another number that um, Catherine you mentioned that I I, I I didn't jot down, but it would. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So I mean, those are pretty, you know, alarming numbers, and I just like to know a little bit more about that. Thank you. Any others? Um, I think the one thing that I'd like to know is, um, in being on campuses, um, seeing engagement of students, um, not just in clubs, but also. Um, like what role teachers are playing in terms of giving up the lunch and such during um, a time I encountered, felt like that was a very safe space for students that they felt safe and they were really engaged in that. So I just kind of want to get an assessment of how many clubs exist on our various campuses, what they are, and um, what resources, if any, are available for staff. And if they're, oh, uh, Trustee Bowie. And to add on Director Flores's request, are we able to look into like the updates for not just Santa Rosa High School because that's seventy percent of sophomores that was for Santa Santa Rosa High School? Are we able to look at like all the other high schools in our district as well? And moving on to item I, information items are attached uh, to the agenda. Um, Superintendent Chanel, any final words before we adjourn? Thank you so much for everyone who's still with us <laughs> um, online and in person. Um, and it is a little after nine o'clock. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Our meeting is adjourned.